Hello, hello, and welcome to Crime and Court. My name is Heather, and this is part five of the state's case of the 1993 Menendez brothers' trial for the unaliving of their parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez. Um, I see we have one person in the chat. Is that you, Sherry? I don't know. Sherry said hello earlier, so hi, Sherry. And um, if there's someone else there, hello. All right, what are we... What am I doing? Um, so this is the first person on the stand that we're going to watch is Wesley Grouse or Gross. And he is a handwriting expert. So um, let's get that started. Right. Mr. Grouse, what do you do for a living, please? I'm employed by the L.A. County District Attorney's Office as a forensic document examiner. How long have you been so employed? For the past seven years. And what kind of schooling did you uh, go to and what kind of training did you get in order to become a handwriting examiner? My training began during my formal education, which was during my, uh, I was obtaining a Master of Forensic Sciences degree at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C., where I took courses that involved uh, the examination of forensic documents, forensic document examination. Following my schooling, I did an internship with the United States Secret Service in Washington, D.C. with the Forensic Services Division, where I worked with eight uh, different forensic document examiners examined mostly handwriting on treasury checks and threatening letters to the president. And then following that, I accepted a position with the county auditor controller's office as a document examiner where I worked for two years and completed my training there under the supervision of another uh, document examiner. And then I came to be with the DA's office. Did you conduct um, a handwriting comparison in regards to this particular case? Yes, I did. And were you provided with known samples of the handwriting of Eric Menendez and Lyle Menendez? Yes. Um, counsel for Lyle Menendez, would you stipulate that Mr. Gross has in his possession known samples of handwriting of your client? Yes. And counsel for Eric Menendez, would you stipulate that Mr. Gross has in his possession known samples of the handwriting of your client? Yes. Thank you. Now, Mr. Gross, I've just used the term, and I think you did too, known samples. Could you tell the jury what a known sample is? Sure. Uh, a known sample is writing which is attributed to a particular writer by whoever pre presents the case to me, where they have some basis for knowing that a particular person wrote that writing. Since I don't take writing samples from any individuals. They bring writing to me. They tell me this was done by one particular person. And then that's what we consider known writing. Now, there's another kind of document that you deal with in your profession as well that's called a question document. Yes. Hence the term question document examiner. Yes. Okay. A question document then, could you tell us what that is? Sure. A, a question document is any document which comes into question, uh, usually in the legal process and in the type of work I do specifically in criminal cases, where there comes to be a question as to whether or not the writing on a document or typewriting or printing was done by a particular person or uh, was is it a counterfeit document or something like that. So any time there's questions about a document, then it's, it's titled question document. And we've submitted a question document in this case as well as the known samples. Yes. Your Honor, may I approach, please? Yes. I have one more known sample. It's been marked as Exhibit um, 51. I'm going to show it to you now and ask you if you recognize how to review it in your analysis. Yes. And for the record, um, 51 are the, hand, the signatures of uh, Mr. Donovan Goudreau, which resembles some sort of medical work. Anyway, um, Your Honor, I'm going to... <coughs> I have here a I believe this is 53. I'd like to ask you if you recognize the bill of what you need to work with. Yes. You work with the smaller um, original forms, is that correct? Yes. Now, when this was submitted to you, which portion of this document 53 was considered the question portion of the involved? Only the signature. Okay, and on this page, the signature appears to be um, marked with a yellowish pen. Yeah, yes. In addition, did you, were you asked to try to determine the origin of two other signatures that appear to be the same name? Yes. Two pages? Yes. Now, there's terminology that's used by handwriting examiners, there, which is particular to handwriting examiners. Yeah. Okay, now, when you uh, determine that handwriting belongs to a particular person. How do you refer to that? If that was my conclusion? Yes, I'm not talking about this case. I'm talking about right. in general. In general. In general, you can make a positive identification of the writer saying that whoever wrote the known documents wrote the question documents. But that basically you identify who the writer is. Now, is that the kind of um, identification that's 100%? That's in other words, it's this person and nobody else in the whole world? Yes. Okay. And what are the degrees of certainty that you have in your profession? There's, it, it depends on the examiner, but in general, the uh, accepted terminology would range anywhere from a totally inconclusive where you can make no determination all the way up to say that positively somebody wrote it or positively someone did not write it. And then there's about uh, usually two or three steps in between there of, of certainty. 
And so you can also eliminate people as having written things too, is that correct? Yes. Right. Now in this particular example, um, having the known handwriting of Donovan Goudreau, Eric Menendez, and Lau Menendez, were you able to determine who actually uh, made the signature which is depicted on uh, the three signatures on 53? Are you asking me, was I positively able to determine that? Right. No, I was not. Okay. And why weren't you able to? Because in, well, in this signature in particular, it appeared, it appeared to be a simulation of a true signature, and when usually when a, a simulation is involved, it's very difficult and usually impossible to determine the author. You know, what is a simulation? Simulation is is mm -hmm. where somebody somebody well, there's actually a couple kinds of simulation. You have a simulation where someone knows what the signature looks like, and they are trying to <coughs> simulate it, make it appear that it is a true signature. And you also have some that that comes into two categories. One where you're actually copying it. You have the a signature, a true signature right in front of you and you try and copy it as close as you can. Then you have a type where you're doing it from your memory and you're trying to remember how it was and simulate the writing. And then another type is where you're simulating someone's writing without having any model to go from. You don't even really know how they write. You just simulate a signature. Right. Were you able, can you tell from this signature what kind of simulation it is? It appears that they had a model to go from. How can you say that? Based on having seen the true signatures of Donovan Goudreau. All right. There was an attempt to make it look like the true signature of Donovan Goudreau. Now, um, were you able to, I, I take it you were not able to make this 100%, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, um, when you, as an expert, come into court and say, I'm making this 100%, you're excluding everybody in the world, is that correct? Yes. All right. Um, but if, if you had to choose between the signature of um, Donovan Goudreau, Eric Menendez, or Lyle Menendez, do you have an opinion as to which handwriting most probably made the signature on the form? Yes. And is most probably something you're comfortable with, or would you rather use different terminology? No, most probably is fine. All right. And what was your opinion? Most probably was Eric. And uh, Eric Menendez, is that correct? Yes. Now, did you notice anything about the spelling of the name in the, in the signatures that are depicted on 53? Yes. What did you notice? The, the names are misspelled on all three signatures that are in question. All right. And as to uh, the first, well, do you recall how they're misspelled? I believe it's the, uh, the last name, Goudreau. The, the U was left off the end on all three. All right. I have nothing further. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Gross. My, my understanding is that you believe that uh, the uh, writer simulated Donovan Goudreau's signature, correct? Correct. But misspelled the name in yes. the simulation. Correct. Okay. Um, and you believe that there was a model that was used uh, in order to try and simulate Donovan Goudreau's name. Correct? Well, they, the person who signed it would have had to know how he signed his name, yes. Okay. And uh, models of handwriting often appears on uh, things like driver's license, right? Yes. Uh, and let me show you an exhibit which has been marked as 49 A and B. Yes. Okay, and does that driver's license also appear to have a signature on it? Yes, it does. And that kind of looks like the signature that's on the known exemplars for Don Goudreau, which I believe 51. Actually, it doesn't look a whole lot like those, but uh, if you had, I, I had a better copy of it. Better copy, <laughs> yes. okay. Um, <coughs> Mr. Gross, would additional handwriting exemplars uh, from either Eric or Lyle Menendez have aided you in? Uh, making your determination? No. Okay. Why? I had an extensive amount of writing to, to work with, so I didn't need any additional writing. All right. Thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Gross, when did you make your examination of the question documents? I made it, I believe it was in July of last year. And before you made your examination, did another handwriting expert examine the documents? I believe so. I was told so. And was that Mr. Glenn Owens of the California Department of Justice? That's what I was told, yes. I object any further questions as being here, so you're on. Let yeah. me lay a foundation if I could. All right. Did you uh, have available in doing, either before or at the time of your examination, the report by Mr. Owens? No, sir. You never saw it at no. any point in time? I don't recall ever seeing it. During your direct examination, you mentioned they. Do you remember that? Something about they used a model. Oh. They, if that sounds plural, is that what you mean? Well, my question is, is there any indication on the question documents that more than one person was writing on the document? No. Were there indications, based on your examination, that Lyle Menendez did not write the question document?
not in a positive, I could not positively <coughs> eliminate him, no. Well, let me ask you if uh, you can explain this statement. Basic letter formation differences suggest another writer is responsible. What does that mean? That means that the letter designs that were used are not uh, the way that that, that, it, that, that writer would, would form those letters. And were there basic uh, letter formation differences between the question documents on the one hand and Lyle Menendez's known writing on the other? Yes. That's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Wickham, what do you do for a living? I'm a computer consultant. And what does a computer consultant do? Uh, my company provides. Uh, so now this is, uh, as he said, he's a computer consultant. He was hired by Lyle Menendez. And um, we're going to hear from him for a little bit. And then we're also going to hear from another computer consultant that was hired by Carlos, the uncle. So that'll be interesting. By its emergency response service and support for people with computer systems. We'll, people will call us up and we'll go and solve problems for them. We'll install systems, fix systems, repair systems sell them, advise them what they should or shouldn't buy. Do you um, own a company called Leviathan Development? Yes, I do. I have partners, but I'm president and one of the principal stockholders. And is Leviathan Development located in what part of the city, please? Um, we're in West Los Angeles. And what kind of training do you have in computers? Um, about 10 years, of, 10 years of having worked on them in the field, I have a bachelor's degree in applied mathematics with a specialization in computability in computers from UCLA. And then I've been providing network service and support since 1984. Now, when we're talking about computers, do you specialize in just the IBM type of computer but, or Apple as well? Primarily, primarily IBM type computers, IBM compatibles. Right. On August the 31st of 1989, about 1.30 in the afternoon, were you inside of your car in the city of Beverly Hills? Yes, I was. And did you get a phone call in your car asking you to go somewhere? Yeah, I received a page from my office. Um, I called the office and spoke to my dispatcher. And he said that he'd received an emergency call from a gentleman in, in Beverly Hills who needed to have some files recovered off of a computer system. It needed to be done that afternoon as he was leaving on a flight for the East Coast in a few hours. And since I was three or four blocks away, could I take that call? So, and what did you do? So I took the phone number, wrote it down, wrote down the name of the number. I wrote down it was a, a Lyle Mendez. I wrote the name down incorrectly. Um, called him on my car phone, told him that I was a few blocks away and would be over in a few minutes, and proceeded to, I believe the address was 722 North L, and proceeded to their home. And did you park on the street? parked on the street across the street, um, directly across from the house. Okay. Did you have any difficulty in getting admitted to the house? Um, when I got out of my car and walked up to the home, it was a series of locked gates with armed security guards, like Bel, Bel Air Patrol type guards. When I walked up to the gate, they asked me who I was. I told them that I was Howard Wick and I was there to see Lyle Menendez. Lyle Mendez. Um, he corrected me, said it was Menendez, and went, told me to wait a second, he would go get him. And did, in fact, he come, go and get Lyle Menendez? And so he went into the house, and a moment later, Lyle came out of the house. They let me in the gate, and he escorted me into the home. Do you see Mr. Lamon in court here today, please? Yes, I do. And what color um, top is he wearing? Mm, kind of greenish, grayish. I don't know what color is it. And it's this gentleman here. He's referring to the defendant at counsel table, Lyle Menendez. Thank you. Once you gained entry into the house, where did you go? Um, Lyle escorted me upstairs into a bedroom and showed me the computer, which was an IBM XT computer, immediately to the right of the door. He stepped in the door, and to your right in the corner was the computer. And when you say it's an IBM XT, that means the manufacturer of the computer was an IBM? The manufacturer of the computer was an IBM, and it was a, an older model of right. computer. Your Honor, I have here an exhibit which has been marked as exhibit 63. May I approach the witness, Yes. Mr. Wicked, I'm showing you a photograph, and I'd like to ask you if you recognize the room, which is the big room area. Yes, I do. Do you yes. see um, a computer in that photograph? Yeah, this is the, the room that I came into, and this is the computer off in the corner. And you can tell it's an XT by the fact that the front of the computer is black black disk drives instead of gray disk drives. Okay, by the disk drive, do you mean the, the entry for where you put the... Where you put the little, where you put the little floppy disk. So that's, that is the computer that I worked on. All right, now, Mr. Wicken, um, before you began to work on a computer, did someone ask you to do something with the computer? Yeah, when I, when I arrived, is when we walked upstairs, I asked Lyle what it was that he would, what was it he needed me to do, what he was trying to accomplish. Now, what he told me is that he had a series of files that he desperately needed to recover that they had been, been erased or damaged, and he needed, those, he needed those files, and could I please try to find them on the computer for him? Did he um, identify the names of the files? Yeah, as I remember, it was four names, Lyle, Eric, Will, and Menendez. Now, for those of us here who are not very computer literate, could you give us a very basic rundown of what a file is inside of a computer? Um, yeah, when you... When you work on a computer, when you run like a program like a word processor, like WordPerfect or a spreadsheet like Lotus, 
the information that you create. You sit at the keyboard and you type, you type in, let's say you want to write a letter to a friend. So you sit at the, the keyboard, like a typewriter, and you type the letter. And it will save it on the computer's hard disk in a file with a name. So when you're done, you say, you know, I want to save this file. I want to save my work that I've done. It will ask you for a name, and you'll say Lyle or Eric, whatever you want to name the file. Hit a key, and it will save it on the hard disk so that you have a per, uh, semi-permanent magnetic record of that information. Now, what is a hard disk? A hard disk is a device, it's a, it's a component in a computer that allows for permanent storage or semi-permanent storage of information. There's two ways that a computer can store information. One is called RAM, which is electronic memory, and it's only usable when the computer is turned on. So like when you're working on your program, while you're typing it, it keeps it in, this, in RAM, it keeps it in the power on memory. But if you want to keep it till the next day, you want to have something that will keep it when you turn the computer off, when you turn the power off. So they've created something that's magnetic, which is a floppy disk or a hard disk, which will store the information in a more permanent fashion. So I can turn the computer off, and it will hold the information until the next time I turn it on. Did you, in fact, attempt to access the hard disk of the computer, which is shown in Exhibit 63? Yes, I did. And how did you do that? Um, once he gave me the names of the files that he wanted to find, the first thing I did is I sat down and I typed a directory. You can, the, the way a computer stores information on a hard disk is it keeps a list of files. As if you were keeping a file drawer, you would have each file folder, and you'd write the name of a file and store it. So what I did is I sat down at the computer and first looked. The simplest way was just to look and see the names of every file on the hard disk. And there's a little software program you can run that will show you every single file anywhere on the hard disk and show you the name of the file. Okay. The, the simplest way people lose files is they just misplace them. They move them to a different list. You know, they put it in the wrong drawer, so to speak. So the first thing I did was look to see whether the file existed. All right, now, you said something about you had a program to look to see what was on the hard disk. Is that correct? Yeah, the first tool I believe I used was Xtree. First I used just the standard, the standard DOS, the standard operating okay. system. Now, right, okay. Back You're starting Sorry. to talk computer all right? right. What, could you explain what DOS is? All right, DOS is the basic, it's the very elementary program that tells a computer how to act like a computer. The, one of the wonderful things about a computer is you can make it do anything. I mean, I can use a, a computer as uh, an imitation airplane so I can sit and look at a screen and play. I can use it as a game. I can use it to write letters. You can basically do anything with it. The thing that tells the computer how to be an IBM computer is something called a disk operating system, it DOS. And it's the very, very basic program. There's a certain, a certain set of commands or things you can tell it to do, one of which is something called DIR, D -I -R, which says, give me a list of every file. Okay, now, if, if a file has been deleted from the directory, is there a way to see if it's still stored inside of the computer? Yeah, in fact, the way, the way DOS deletes a file. So for example, when I create a file, it writes it magnetically onto the, onto the hard disk. So now the information is stored as a series of ones and zeros on a hard disk. And then it has another place, which is this index, the list of what's there. When I delete a file, it doesn't actually touch the data. When I say delete or erase a file, it leaves the information on the disk. It just goes to the list and changes the name of the file in the index to like a question mark. So for example, if you have, you know, take a, a telephone book, the yellow pages. If I want to hide your, if I want to hide your information, or if I want to erase your information, I don't have to actually take the information out. If I just change the first letter of your name to a question mark, it makes it very difficult to find it again. All right. So, so let me let me stop you for a second. Then, if you had deleted the file um, from the directory, okay, the directory is what you turn on the computer, you write DIR, and it will show you a list of what's on the okay. computer. If I delete a file, when I turn the directory on, the name won't be on there anymore. Right. The file will be on the disk, but the name won't appear on the directory. Okay. So is there a way by which you can go into the hard drive and ask it to give you all the files that have been deleted before? Right, so there's a tool called Norton Utilities that okay, I now, used. Norton, is that spelled N-O-R-T-O-N? N-O-R-T-O-N, Utilities. Is that a program? That is a program. Now, in relationship to the four items that you were asked to look for, did you look for them in the directory? First, I looked for them in the directory. Did you find them in the directory? Um, I found a couple of the names of the file. Like, I found, I found a file called Menendez, as an example. But when I looked at the actual file, so when I looked at the actual file, what the file contained was a printout of the directory that, that someone or somehow had managed to already erase the file, but not by telling it, please erase me, by copying something else over the top of it. Okay. Now, did you, you said you found the word Menendez in the directory. Did As you, a file name. Okay. Did you find any other file names in the directory? Um, I also believe I found Will, Eric, and Lyle. Okay. Now, um, Mr. Witkin, when you were told the, the word Will, W-I-L-L, -L, did you consider that to be an abbreviation for the name William, or did you understand it to be the name of a document, or what, did, what, was, you, what was in your mind? As I understood it, and as I understood it, it was three first names, you know, three, pro three proper names and one last name. Like Larry Moe and Larry, Curly Joe. Right. Okay. But it was Lyle, Eric, and short Lyle, who I knew there existed a human being named Lyle because I was standing there talking to him. Eric, which I assumed was some, you know, another first male first name, and Will, which I assumed was short for William. Um, now, you testified that you found something in the file called Menendez, but it was basically just... Right. Each of the files, what I found was each of the files that I did find 
had no meaningful information. What they, they each were, each of them was an exact copy of the other, and what they contained was a listing of the actual directory, as if someone had someone had copied the directory, as if someone had someone had copied the directory over those files. If your colleague said when you delete a file, it doesn't actually take the information off; it just changes the name. It just changes the name. The one way you can get the information off is write something else right over the top of it. Yeah, so apparently someone had written over the top trying to obscure these three files, or either purposefully or accidentally, but someone had actively covered those files with. All right, now is one of the things you're asked to do in your profession to go and correct mistakes that people make on their computers? One of the most common things you do. All right. right? I mean, a major piece. In fact, this, this tool, Norton Utilities, um, Peter Norton, who crea originally created it, managed to build a multi-million dollar company out of one product out of an unerased product, a product essentially for just taking when someone else accidentally erases a file and recover it. Right. So it's a very, very common thing to want to do. After you located these various files and found that there was no meaningful information inside, did you communicate that fact to Lyle Menendez? Yeah, I did. The first thing I did is once I realized that they had nothing meaningful, the next step that I took, um, I told them that there was nothing in the files, but there was a tool I could use, again, a piece of Norton Utilities, to search through the whole disk, ignoring files, but just looking at every letter on the disk and trying to find those names to see if they existed someplace else, either in a different file name or if in a file that had been erased and just was still where the, the raw information was there but no longer attached to a file. Okay. Did you ask him if you should do that, or did you tell him you were going to I do that? I told him I was going to do that. Okay. Now, during the period of time that you were making your search, where was Lyle Menendez? Uh, coming in and out of the room. When I began, he stood behind me and stood with me. He left the room, came back in, in several times. A couple of times he was in the room with me, made a, you know, made a phone call, and walked back and forth. He was arranging a, okay. a, a dinner date or a dinner appointment for that afternoon and arranging a a flight back to, or discussing a flight back to New Jersey. But he was with me, you know, watching what I was doing, would leave, come back, and watch again what I was doing. And Mr. Whitkin, did you, in fact, then use the portion of Norton Utilities to search the hard disk to see if you could find any other words or references to the items you've been asked to look right, for? So I searched the complete hard disk everywhere and found that those files, those, the words, existed no place else on the hard disk except as those three file names containing essentially meaningless information. And I told Lionel this, that it, uh, unfortunately I had failed, was unable to recover any useful or meaningful data for him. What did he reply to you after you told him that? Um, what he told me is that was very good, because in fact he didn't want to recover the information. He wanted to make sure that the information was not in fact there and couldn't be recovered even by someone who was actively trying to recover the information. Now, were you actively trying to recover the information? Just doing my best. And about how much time do you think you spent doing that? Uh, 20 minutes to half an hour. All right, after um, Lyle Menendez told you what you just related to us, what happened then? Um, I told him I'd been unable to recover it, and then he asked, could I erase it to make sure that even if I had, even if I hadn't been good enough at recovering it, maybe someone else could? Was there a way I could erase the information to guarantee that it could never be recovered? Okay, did he tell you why he wanted that done? Um, he told me that the computer actually contained you know, contained personal financial information that they were selling the computer, and the information on the machine was confidential. They did not want it released or anyone else seeing it, um, which again is a, a common thing to do. If you if you have a computer and you want to give it to someone else and you have confidential information, there's a tool for erasing it. Again, part of Norton Utilities. All right, did you, in fact, erase the computer at that point? So I then used, there's the Norton Utilities has a file called Wipe Disk, which will go, and I said, you know, you, the, the only true way to erase a file is to write something else over it. So what Wipe Disk does is it goes to the whole hard disk, and every single character, every possible place to put a piece of information, it writes a 1, and then a 0, and then a 1, and it just it forces it so that it, there is no way to ever see what was on, the inf what was on that disk beforehand. Would, so Norton Utilities uses a method of doing 1, what it, what it does is information on a computer is stored as either a one or a zero, either an on switch or an off switch. So okay. the way you can erase something is you write something else over it. it, it is, is it common in the field of people who understand computers that if you saw a computer that had ones and zeros all through it that you would think the Norton Utilities white disk had been used? You can generally tell when you search. If you go and search the, the, if you look at the disk outside of the files, the pieces of the disk that should be random information, because until you write a file, it's just it's, it's random what's out there. So if you looked at the places that should be random and saw that they were all ones or all zeros, it's clear that someone had been there and used this wipe disk tool. Now, I believe that when you were explaining your basic course on computers to us, you referred to floppy disks. Is that correct? Right. Did you see any floppy disks there? When yeah, there, there was there? on the, the desk. There were several other boxes of floppy disks. And in fact, the next question that I was asked um, was, for, you know, first I was asked, could you recover? When I said it was impossible to recover, I was asked, can you make sure that it's really impossible to recover? When I did that, the next question that I was asked is, can you make it look as if you were never here. Can you restore the files so that it does, so it would not be clear to someone that the disk had been erased? And who said that to you? Lyle asked me to do that. He asked yeah. me, could you erase it? Could you, could you make it look as if no one had erased anything on here? During the period of time that you were working in the bedroom on the computer, aside from Lyle Menendez, did anyone else ever come in the room? No. Um, were you able to make it look like you were ne never there? 
um, apparently not perfectly. But what I did is I took the, the discants that contained copies of the original programs that had been on the computer and reloaded those programs, recreated files. So that if you, if, if you just picked up the computer and looked at the computer, you would see a computer with a series of programs loaded on it and have no reason to, to suspect that anyone, that it had ever been formatted or erased or unerased or anything. So the floppy disks that you saw and used were disks of various programs that one uses in running a computer, is that right? They were, they were, in fact, copies of the programs that had been on the computer before I did the wipe disk. Because once you do the wipe disk, it not only erases files, it erases every program, erases everything off of the hard disk. So I put those programs back on the hard disk. So for instance, if I had Windows inside of my computer and you did the wipe disk and wiped out the computer, then I'd have to reinstall Windows. Is right. that correct? Right. Um, how long were you there? Do you remember? Again, about 20 minutes to half an hour. The entire yeah. time? Yeah, it's not a very... It was not, it's not a very lengthy process. Uh, at some point, did you write a receipt for your services, sir? I did. Um, your Honor, I have here um, an original receipt and also a uh, well, copy of it. It has to be marked as uh, you want to mark them as 64 and 64 duplicate. Add the original and also a blow up. You have one blow up and one original, is that yes, it? Yes, Your Honor. All right, well, no, make the um, original, original 64 and a blow up 65. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes. Mr. Wickens, I'm going to show you Exhibit 64 and also the blow-up of it. Um, is this the actual receipt that you left that day after performing the services you described? Yes, it is. And this appears to be a your copy of it? Yes, it is. Now, the receipt um, indicates the date of the 31st of August of 1989. Yes, it does. And was that, in fact, the date that you were at um, the home? Yes, it was. And do you remember where it was you left the receipt when you left the house that day? Um, if you look at the picture, just in front of the computer is a television set with like, a VCR on it. I left it on top of that TV and VCR. Were you paid for your services that day? Um, yes. Lyle wrote me a check. And was that done in your presence? It was done in my presence. Um, he, wrote it, he wrote it to cash in the amount of $150. Your Honor, I have your check. Um, yeah, when we, do, we deposited the check, it came back from our bank um, as undepositable with a stamp on it that says, refer to maker. And a after it came back to you, did you save it? Um, we did. And did you give it to the police sometime? Yeah, um, I believe it was the 11th of December when I spoke to the police and gave them my original statement. I also gave them this check. So on December the 11th of 1989, you had an interview with the police, is that correct? Yes. And at that time, um, did you identify the check that you've just shown us? It was Exhibit 66? Um, yes, I did. And did you give them a statement about your activities on August the 31st of 1989? Yes, I did. Now, when you spoke to the police, you, did you review a copy of the police report before testifying today? Yeah, I did. Okay. When you spoke to the police, I believe you indicated that Lyle Menendez asked you to look for three files, which were Menendez, Eric, and Will. Right. And I believe your testimony here and in front of the grand jury was that you were asked about four files. Right. Okay. What is your best recollection as to what you were asked by Lyle Menendez? Was it three or four items? Four files. I apologize. I was a little scared the first time through. When you say, where, when were you scared? When I spoke to the police and also when I... <laughs> How about, were you nervous in front of the grand jury? Definitely nervous in front of the grand jury. Right. Also nervous now. But. All right. Well, um, one uh, final question. Do you, um, does your business, Leviathan Development, advertise in the yellow pages? <coughs> yes, it does. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further to put in all right, cross-examination. Mr. Wicken, this is about 1.30 in the afternoon when you received this call on August 31st, is that yes, right? Yes, And I think you told us that you actually had a telephone call with Lyle Menendez before you arrived at the house, is that right? Yes, sir. And what was the telephone conversation you had with him at that time? Roughly along the lines of, hello, this is Howard Wicken. I'm with Leviathan Development. You called my office um, for a service call. Do you still need that? Exactly where do you need me to go? And I should be there in a few minutes. I'm just a few blocks from you. All right, and at that time, Lyle Menendez told you that he wanted you to retrieve some information from his computer, yes, sir. and he wanted you to do it immediately. Isn't that what he told you? Yes, sir. He didn't use the words desperately as you testified in cross-examination, did he? Word for word, I don't recall. It's been four years. But the, my, my general impression was it was an emergency. It needed to happen then that day. We had a couple of hours before he was leaving Los Angeles. Um, but whether, I mean, I'm sure the word desperate wasn't spoken. I don't remember the exact word-for-word -word conversation. By the way, you reviewed, I think you said, your grand jury testimony before you testified here today, right? Yes, sir. And you reviewed a police report that contained an interview that you had with the Beverly Hills Police Department in December of 1989? Yes, sir. And did you remember when you were reading the part of your grand jury testimony that at one point during the grand jury proceedings you were asked what you did for a living, and your answer was at page 84, we are an emergency response troubleshooting firm, so people would call us with any computer-related problems. Unfortunately, one of the most common is, quote, I have erased something, I have lost it, help, I desperately need this, 
in quotes. You remember giving that testimony? Something to that effect. Right, so that's probably where this word desperately came from. You were describing in general the state of people that call you up and desperately want you to come over and retrieve something from a computer. Possibly, yes. Right, now, after you had the telephone conversation, or even before it, I think your impression was that the name of the person you were dealing with was Lyle Mendez, correct? Right, as I actually wrote it down on my little notes that I was keeping, I wrote it down as Mendez. And was that a mistake you made, your office made, or did Lyle Menendez say my name is Lyle Mendez? I sincerely doubt that he gave the name incorrectly. I'm pretty positive. That either I heard it incorrectly or my dispatcher heard it incorrectly. And in any event, when you arrived at the house, somebody there informed you that the correct name of the person you were dealing with was Lyle Menendez, correct? Yes, sir. And then you had a conversation with Lyle in which he introduced himself as Lyle Menendez? I believe he introduced himself just as Lyle. And at that point, you knew his name was Menendez because the security guard had said the true name is Lyle Menendez. Yeah, I think that the, the time that I was absolutely certain what the last name was was at the very end when I had a check that said Menendez. So when I actually looked and you know, when I went and took the check with me, then I was sure it was Menendez. At what point I realized that I had the name incorrect, I can't recall. Right, Whether it was exactly at the beginning or some point sure. in a later conversation. At, at any point in time when you were dealing with Lyle Menendez that day, did he ever say to you, this is a confidential, words to the effect of, this is a confidential matter and I don't want you disclosing that you and I had this conversation? Um, no, the only thing that he stated to me that was confidential was the information on the system. As the reason why, As he, the reason like, why he wanted the information eliminated. And when you say the information, you mean everything that was on there that you would retrieve, correct? Yes, sir. In other words, he never said to you, I just want the information relating to the word Will, or the other words I think you said were Lyle, Eric, and Menendez, correct? No, the, the, the times at which there was a specific reference to specific files or specific information was at the point when I was asked, can you find this information? When we got to the point of can you eliminate, it's this and the you know the information on this computer is confidential. We're getting rid of the computer. Please make sure that that confidential information is is eliminated. And that made perfect sense to you in terms of what you do for a living. Absolutely. What people ask you to do. Absolutely. Could you tell whether that computer had been wiped before you got there? It had not been, it had not been wiped. Meaning no one had used something like wipe file that eliminates everything on the disk. But the three files that I was looking for. The information that they had, in the three files or four files that I was looking for, the information that they possessed, which was essentially a directory listing, would have been very difficult. It, it's not reasonable that I would have found the exact same copy of the same information in all four of those files that was time stamped, you know, one minute apart, unless someone had consciously copied that information over those files. So the whole disk had not been consciously erased, but it was my impression that someone, whether purposefully or accidentally, had made a conscious effort and copied information over those files. How old was that computer? Probably four years, five years. I mean, it was an XT, so at that point, it was it was already an old an old style. It was already a, an outdated technology. And just in general, how easy was it to for someone unskilled in operating that computer to learn how to use that as compared maybe to some simpler computers? The pro, from what I recall, the programs that he had loaded were very were very simple and very basic programs. So, I mean, I could teach teach my mom to use it in probably an hour. <laughs> All right. Maybe and, a little longer. And did Lyle Menendez ever say that he knew how to operate the computer? No, sir. Did he ever say that he had attempted to retrieve the information off the computer? I don't recall. Now, as I understand it, you started looking um, through the system, and at, at one point you identified, I think you said four words, correct? Yes, sir. And the four words were Will, Eric, Menendez, and, and Lyle. Lyle. Yes, sir. And then from seeing those words, you then did a directory search and came up with a list under Menendez? I came up with a list that included several of those several of those file names, including including Menendez. As you do a list, you see files, you know, command files. You see all of the different program files within the system. All right, and I have three computer programs which I've had marked as Exhibit 68, 69, and 70. 68 is actually a printout. Yeah. And at the top of the printout, it shows the words C slash print Menendez, correct? Yes. And just looking down the program here, or the printout, can you tell what's being done by the person who's operating yeah, it? Yeah, whoever, whoever is attempting to use this. The first, if you notice, as it's printing each line, it's printing the DOS print. It's printing everything as it would appear on the screen. Generally, when you type on a computer, it doesn't print out each thing that's displayed on the screen. The one way to get it to do that is there's a, there's a key that says print screen that you can hit and then force it to print everything as you do. What it looks like is it is someone making, someone who doesn't understand how the machine works, making their best effort to try to print these files. So the first thing is they probably hit the print, print control print screen, which didn't work, which then put it in print mode, and then they're trying to print file, you know, print file after file. And but does so it indicate the files that are sought to be printed are first of all Menendez? Yeah, this this doesn't imply anything about what's actually there, but it says someone's trying to print a file called Menendez, but the syntax is wrong. The, the way they're doing it is incorrect. 
they have some knowledge because they're actually using real DOS commands. They're just using them improperly. You know, another print command, another find command looking for Menendez, another one looking for something called will, something trying to find will. Um, Again, all improper all, commands. All improper, improperly executed, but it's close. And is that basically what you were doing when you were there? That no, sir. In terms of calling up the words Menendez and will after you found those listed in the directory? Similar, but with, I mean, with the commands done correctly. Right. And looking at exhibit number 69, I wonder if you could tell us what that is. This looks like an actual directory listing. <coughs> and that's a directory listing that you would obtain, at least on that computer, if, if you gave it a command to search. I'm not, I, on I couldn't say what computer this came from. This is not a document I've ever seen before, so I'm not sure where this. On whatever computer that was printed on. Yeah, this is, this is someone asking for a Dura list of all files that are in what's called the root directory, the, the very lowest level list, the most basic list on the computer. We have to clarify that uh, this is or is not uh, what you saw when you did uh, your computer search. Uh, to tell you the truth, I have no idea whether this is from that computer or not. Okay. It could be, to, to, re to reproduce this would be very simple from just pretty much any computer. Any computer that had those files? That had, yeah, that they had these specific files. And that printout was made using the... This looks like it was just made just by doing a dir, but someone who had already done a control print screen. And what is this uh, line meaning volume in drive C is, and then in capital letters, Menendez? Um, you have the ability on any PC to type in a command called label, which will allow you to assign that PC a name. It's not a permanent name, so if I wanted to take, if there's any PC in the room, I can take it in a second and just say label Menendez, and then do a directory, and then say label Whitkin, and the, the label would be gone. So this is whoever, whoever printed this directory, at some, at some point, typed out label Menendez. Either if this is the machine that was in that room, then that could be that, if, or it could be from a machine in your office as a recreation, or... Right. And how about anywhere. Exhibit 7? Could you describe what that uh, purports to be? <coughs> it looks like a directory listing of a subdirectory, a subdirectory called... <coughs> no. It looks to be a directory, a subdirectory listing, but if you look again, the command, what appears to be the command that's creating it is not a command that could create it. So this is a printout from some sort of, from some sort of file, but it's a list of half a dozen <coughs> files, including one called Will, one called Menendez, and one called List. And, and this, this strikes me as similar, when I had said before that each of the three files contained, contained garbage, contained no meaningful information, this is similar to, the, to what would have been in each of those files. This is similar to what I saw, where what the file contained was actually a you know, four or five file listing of a directory. All right, and that is Exhibit 70 similar to what you would have seen? Sim similar. I couldn't identify if that's exactly the file. And again, I'm not sure what this is from and it's, you know, what this printout came from or where. Now, you know. under, under the word will in Exhibit number 70, there is a number which says 59, and then next to that number there is what appears to be a date, 1-13-87, right. and what appears to be a time, maybe 4-58-A. Could you explain to the jury what that uh, information means? You know, the way, the way an XT computer works, this is the er the early computer, is it has the ability to track a time and a date, but as a general rule, it tracks that time and date from whatever time you turn it on, starting with February first, nineteen eighty, twelve a.m. So if I took an XT right now, turned it off and turned it on, and asked it what time it was, it would tell me it's twelve a.m. February first, nineteen eighty, and they all start from there. The way you get a different date is you type the word date, hit return, and it'll ask you what date do you want me to think it is, and you tell it what date you want and then you tell it what time you want, and then it will hold that date and time. Newer computers, the AT and, and after that, have a battery. So you create the time when you set up the computer originally, and then generally it keeps track of the time from that date on a going forward basis. And can you so, tell from looking at that printout when the file will was created, at least the one on that printout? It purports to have been created the 13th of January, 1987, but there's no, there's no way to know that for sure. Because basically you can take and create this file I mean, I can, I can create and time and date stamp it any day or any time. Because this machine, when you turn it on, you have to type in the date and the time to it. There's no way really to know whether this is an accurate or an inaccurate date stamp. As a general rule, time and date stamps on XTs are not considered to be reliable. On an AT or a 386 or a 486, where it has an ongoing cl clock calendar that it tracks, you can generally consider those to be reliable. And how about the number 59? What's that in reference to that file called? What that, tracks, what that tracks is the number of bytes, the number of letters in the file. If, if perchance, this were an actual, say this were an actual directory or the actual content of those files, what, I, what you note on it, which I, this is similar to what I recall, is that all three files were the same exact size, which this shows 59. They were all 
you know, fairly trivial, a trivial size. They all contain the exact same contents, which was a four or five file name listing. But also, if you notice on this, regardless of the date, they're time stamped one minute after the other, which means if it had happened accidentally, if, you'd act, if, if, if the machine, like the hard disk, crashed and miscopied files or mislinked a file, you would not find each of the files to be the same size and time stamped one minute after the other, which kind of implies that whoever created the f whoever created these files, whoever wrote over these files, did it in a purposeful fashion. That they went one after the other and copied, you know, typed. If I typed dir space a greater than sign and the word will, I would take exactly this data and stamp it right over whatever had been in the file will. If I then type dir space greater than sign Eric, I do the same thing to Eric, the same thing to Menendez. So it's, what it appears is, however this file was created is it was written one after the other over each of the three files. And just looking at that printout, can you tell how much information, and by how much, I mean how many words, are in that file called will, just looking at the printout? 59 letters, so nothing, nothing substantial. I mean, 59 letters, you figure eight letters a word, so you're looking at eight, ten, you know, eight words, ten words. So in terms of a will, have you it's seen many wills with no. 59 letters in it? No. I mean, definitely, if, if the file itself were a will, it was no longer on that machine when I sat down to look at it. By the way, in your business, have you been called upon to call up a lot of wills on computers? Not that I ever recall. Have you ever heard of a will on a computer? Absolutely. You have? Yeah. Um, I haven't, and I haven't played with it, but in fact, one of the, it's no longer, but what used to be one of the best-selling personal programs was a program that I believe was called Willmaker, which was designed specifically to allow a person to create a will on his own. Um, you take it home, and there's, there's a numerous little programs that are designed to let you create documents. If you don't want to take it, take it outside or you don't want to bear the expense, it will piece the documents together for you. So actually, for personal use, for home use, a will maker was a pretty common piece of software. Um, or in fact, if you want to just take it in, word, in a word processor and just type it up, if you want to be able to, to leave a record, it's a, it's a simple place to do it. Now, I think you said as you were trying to retrieve this information that Lyle Menendez was leaving your area where this computer wasn't going other places? I mean, during the course of the time that I was there, he came right. in and out of the room several times. And he was with me for the first couple of minutes, went away downstairs, came back again, went downstairs, came back again. And I realize it's been four years, but do you remember a conversation you had with him about saving any information on the computer, be it will or anything else? I'm not sure what you mean by to save it. I mean, the original conversation is, can you recover it? In other words, was there, was there a request that a printout be made? Not that I recall. It could have been you simply don't recall. It could be that I simply don't recall. Now, now I know that none of these, like, I could be pretty positive that none of these printouts, possibly with the exception of the one that contains the file content, were while I was there. And um, the one you just picked up is what, Exhibit 7? That is Exhibit 7-0. But I know 60, 68 isn't, only because I know how those commands work. So I know that, I know that this, that wasn't my work, because I know how those commands work. Um, the other I don't, I don't recognize and don't believe it was actually a printout from before I touched it, only because these other subdirectories, for example, the one with the wills in it, don't appear in this listing. So these two are not consistent, as if they didn't come from the same machine at the same time. But 70 may have 70 is possible there. that this may have been a printout of the contents of that file. I don't recall having printed it, but there's certainly the possibility that I did so. Right. Now, in terms of what happened after you told Lyle Menendez that you couldn't retrieve any of the information, he said to you at that point that that was good because what he, was real, what he really would like to do is, since they were selling the computer, he wanted to have all the information on the machine erased. Isn't that one of the things he said? He wanted to... Not necessarily all of the information, meaning like he, I'm sure he didn't, wouldn't mind if the programs themselves hadn't, but apparently there was, what he asked is there was information on the machine that was confidential, you know, private personal financial information that he did not want in anyone else's hands, and could I make sure that that information would not be recoverable. The best way that I know how to do that is to make sure that nothing exists on the disk. If you want to make sure that if you're, if you're, you know, you're an investor and you want to make sure that your investment information or certain inside trader information or confidential information is gone, what you want to do is, is erase it all. And you then used this Norton wipe, wipe disk, disk and to wipe, it clean. wipe it out. Yes, sir. And uh, in terms of someone coming in behind you, a competent computer expert, would that expert be able to tell immediately or at least after a couple of minutes of examination whether the wipe disk had been used? Depending on what he looked, if, if he suspected, like if I suspected someone had used wipe disk before I was there, then I could have discovered that. How I would did have you just, discover that? Um, I would have looked at a sector of the disk that did not contain any files and look to see whether it was random, random ones and zeros, or whether it was all ones or all zeros, and just kind of look or see if there were bits of data. For example, if I create a file and erase it and create it and erase you know, different files, it'll leave scattered bits of data. So you can look in the areas that aren't files and just see what's out there and see whether it's, it's clean. If it's clean, then someone's erased it. If it's got random scattered data, then it's just the natural, you know, nothing's been written there yet. If I didn't know to look for it, I wouldn't have looked in the non-file areas. So it's only if the person suspected that someone had done so 
and was consciously looking for it, that they would have noticed it. Now, when you got them with this transaction, you then told them that it was going to cost them $150 for your yes, services. Sir. Yes, sir. And you wrote out a, a receipt with your name on it, correct? Your company um, name and also your personal name? Yeah, we have standard service authorizations that we use. It was Exhibit 64, I guess, where we use a, stand, a standard document in which we can write what we did. So anyone that we work for, they can go back and later and refer, see what work we had, we had performed for them. So I wrote out a receipt of who I was, who the work was done for, and what was done. And do you keep a copy of that bill that you give to him? Yeah, we keep. There's a co copy that we leave with the customer, a copy that comes back to the customer with the mailed invoice, a copy that we keep, the original sign sheet that we keep in our files. Did Lyle Menendez ever indicate to you that he would not uh, like any paperwork created on this transaction and that he'd give you a little bit extra money if you didn't do that? No, sir. And do you recall him uh, saying, I'd rather pay in cash, or that there wasn't any record of this transaction? I recall him writing the check to cash. But I don't write. I don't recall any offer to actually pay in, in in cash. But he wrote the check to me in, as a check written to cash. Do you remember why that was done? I don't believe he was explicit. All right. And the check itself had the name Menendez right on it, correct? Yes, sir. With the address. Yes, sir. Different address. Different address. And uh, you took that check back to your office and tried to cash it, and the bank sent it back. I right? took it back, turned it over to my controller, who put it in our deposit, and the bank sent it back. And, and that did that kind of bring the transaction back to mind and alert you to the fact that there was some sort of problem? When the bank, when the check came back from the bank, stamped refer to maker, and I saw the next day an article in the newspaper related to the case, I realized it wasn't a real pleasant thing. Right. And, and at that point I called the police and anonymous, anonymously said, I don't know who this is, but you know, here's, here's, here's what happened and here's what I know. And in terms of hiding the transaction, probably not a real good thing to do to give you a bounce check, was it? Sure, Sustained. Did you um, see the article in the paper on December 5th, 1989? Yes, sir, I did. And that was an article in the Los Angeles Times indicating that the police were starting to investigate the possibility that a will had been erased? Yes, sir. And that was the first time I realized that the word will might not have been a first name. Right. And did you have the check between August 31st and December 5th? In other words, up to that point, you had no idea the connection of this transaction with what you saw reported in the newspapers? Um, I knew there was something about it, so I kept everything, pulled everything into a separate file and turned it over to my lawyer and told him, keep this. Someday we may need to do it. In other words, need it. even before that, uh, even before when December When the check 5th, came back, refer to Maker, I realized there was something. I mean, I realized there was a murder case. I realized that I had been in the house, um, and I turned it over to my lawyer. I mean, it wasn't. When I was in the house the original day, um, something about the transaction, and especially when we got to the point of make sure it looked like you hadn't been here, made my spine crawl. So I knew there was something, and I strongly felt, at least subconsciously, that there was something very unusual and very wrong. Let me ask you this. When you went to the house, did you know it was the house where the killings had taken place? I had no awareness of the killings. I generally don't read the murder news. And, and when was it that you decided to give the check to your attorney to hang on for for later use? After the check came back, refer to Maker, a, couple, a, week, a week later, 10 days later, when I saw an article and realized that this case existed is when I gave it to him to hold. So it was probably... The 15th of September. And then on December 5th, you made an anonymous phone call to the Beverly Hills Police Department indicating that you had some information about the computer that they were yes, investigating sir. at that point. Correct? Yes, sir. When I read the article in the Times and realized that it, was, that it was something of significance related to the case, I called the police. And, and at that point, you didn't want to reveal your identity because basically you were fearful of being involved in something as serious as this, correct? Absolutely. And the way that the police got to you, um, well, let me ask you, do you know how the police got your name finally, if you didn't come forward? Um, well, my first question to them when they contacted, I called them on the 5th they call, and told them a little bit of what I knew. They called me on the 6th. Um, my initial speculation was, you know, maybe they traced the call. What I was told is that, in fact, they had served a search warrant on the house, found the receipt, which had my name, our company's address, and phone number. And they contacted me the next morning and asked if I could talk to them. And they told you that that receipt with your name on it was in the exact location where you had left it back on August 31st, 1989, did they? Um, they told me that it was found in the house. I mean, it was found with the computer. They didn't tell me where they had found it. I mean, they didn't tell me where in the room they had found the receipt, but they told me that they had found the receipt with the computer. Still in the house where you had been Still back in the house where I had been. That's all I have. Thank you. Any redirect? Yes, Yes. Absolutely. And 
And even though my computer might think that today is August the 2nd, 1993, I could go home tonight and tell it that it's really March the 2nd, 1972, if I wanted to, right? Two commands, 10 seconds, maybe. All right, so, and then with that, I could recreate a directory. You can rename it Menendez in another couple of seconds and type a directory and now have I, these printouts. I just have a couple more questions. When I create a file in my computer, um, the computer, if it has the date and time correct, will indicate next to the file the date and time that that file was created. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Then if I go back into the file and I change the file, and I tell the computer that I want to save the changes, does the computer put the new date and time when the changes were done? Yes. All right, so in other words, um, I believe in Exhibit 70 there's something about um, will and something about there's a date, and can't, this date appeared to be January 13th, 1987, right. with a time. Um, but that doesn't mean that's when the file was created. That means that's when it was last accessed and changed. That would be when that would be when it was last changed, last written over. And I believe you indicated that there, according to Exhibit 70, that that file created uh, contained 59 bytes. Is that correct? Yes. And byte is computer terminology for one camera. letter. One letter. All right. If in fact um, the file was changed and previously it contained. 20,000 bytes and it had been changed to just 59 bytes, would the fact that there previously had been 20,000 bytes be reflected once you changed it to 59? No. Thank you. I have nothing further. No, Your Honor. Just to clarify, you referred to timestamps <coughs> on the four files that you saw on your computer. Yes. Looked at the computer screen. Is that right? Yes. yes Did you recall what the timestamps were, what the no, dates sir. were? No, sir. I do not. You have no recollection whatsoever? Because on an XT, time and date stamps are so meaningless, I mean, you never look at them, never refer to them. If you look at most XTs, probably half the files are dated 1980, only because most people don't change the time and date. Okay. All right. Anything else? They're basically meaningless. Okay. Thank you. Did Lyle Menendez ask you to look for four specific things inside of the family computer? Yes, ma'am. What are the four things he asked you to look for? He asked me to look for four files, specifically Lyle, a file named Lyle, one named Eric, one named Will, and one named Menendez. Where was the computer physically located within the house? Um, in an upstairs bedroom immediately to the right when you walked in the doors. Um, Your Honor, I believe the witness has in front of him Exhibit 63. I have another one here to put on this board. It's quite small, but uh, Mr. Wicken, briefly, could you tell us what is depicted in the far corner of this picture? Um, this picture shows the bedroom into which I went and it shows the computer in the far corner in the center of this picture. This is, this is the computer that I went to work on. At some point, did you erase that computer? Yes, ma'am, I did. And did you use a particular program to erase the computer? Yes, ma'am, I used a program called Norton Wipe Disk. And is that part of the Norton YouTube? So this is going to be a little bit repetitive because he testified for both juries. I don't know why he testified separately, but for some reason he testified for the Lyle Menendez jury first. So that's what we just heard. So now this is going to be the Eric Menendez jury that is hearing him. Utilities? Yes, ma'am, it is. At the completion of wiping or deleting everything on this computer, did you do something to reload programs onto the computer? Um, yes, I took a series of floppy diskettes that they had. In fact, if you look in the picture, you can see them underneath the computer and reloaded all of the original programs without any of the data files onto that computer. So you had the generic program, but not any specific things that a user would have put into right. that. Right. For example, if you had a word processor, I would have put back the word processor, none of the documents or letters or paperwork that you had personally created, just those files that you would have purchased from the store. Now, uh, was anyone else there with you while you were doing this, aside from Lyle Menendez inside of the home? Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. I have no further questions at this point. Cross-examination. Did you um, turn on this computer and make an effort to locate the four named files that Lyle had asked you to look for? Yes, ma'am, I did. And uh, do you recall whether you ever saw on the screen of that computer any files bearing the names that he had given you? Yes, ma'am. I, fi I did find files on the computer which did have those file names. Okay. Did you find um, a directory on the computer under the name Menendez? Yes, ma'am. I believe I did. Did you also find a file on the computer with the name Menendez? Yes, ma'am. And did you find a file on the computer with the name Will? Yes, ma'am. Now, would you explain to this jury um, what is a file in the sense that we use it when we talk about a computer? If I could look, I can remember how I explained it an hour ago. Now, no. um, a, fi anyway. a file is 
when you create anything on a computer, when you want to create a document, so you want to create, you want to type a letter on your computer. So you sit down at the keyboard and you type, you pull up a program and you type the letters and you give it a name. You say, I want to type, I want to save this letter or this memo or this spreadsheet or whatever it is that you're working with. I want to save it. I want you to keep it for me so I can pull it up at a later time. And you give it a name. And it stores that name. It stores that file, which is the series of information on the computer disk. And then it stores a reference to that information in something called a directory. And the directory is like an index. It's a list of names. Each name refers to a specific file, a specific document, and it tells the computer where to look on the hard disk to find that document when you next want to work with it. And you can give directories different names, too. Right. If you, if you were creating a thousand letters, it becomes very difficult to ever find those again. You, every time you wanted to find a letter, you'd have to look down this list of a thousand. So what it gives you the ability is you can create sublists. So you can make a list called business correspondence and a list called recipes and a list called personal correspondence and start to break it up into subcategories. So you take that thousand letters and if 300 were business correspondence, they'd show up under a subdirectory called right. business correspondence. Right. Now when you saw on this computer a file or document called will, um, is there something that you have to do when you see a file name on a computer to actually look at what the document says. Yes, there is. If you look at, if you're at the, if you're just in DOS, the basic operating system that tells a computer how to be a computer, the only thing that you'll really see is the list, is the index. If you actually want to see the contents, depending on how that was created, if it was created in some word processors, I can, I have to either run the word processor itself because it puts special codes. It doesn't print it as normal letters. It, it puts it in a, in a coded format. So some programs you have to run the actual program itself to see it. Some of them, if it's mostly text, if it's mostly just the letters, you know, A, B, C, D, you can copy it to the screen, you can copy it to a printer, but you do have to, I mean, it's, it's a different command to see the reference to the document than it is to actually see the text or the body of the document itself. Okay, DOS, the basic operating system for the computer. If, if you turn on a computer and you're in that operating system and you want to know the names of all the files or a list of all the files, you basically only have to type in DIR for directory. Right. And it will then print up on the screen the name of every single file that's been created. With, right. Within that directory. If you wanted to go into one of those subdirectories, as we spoke, you would need to be explicit. Instead of saying dir, you'd say dir space Menendez, and it would show you all of the files that were within the subdirectory called Menendez. But let's assume you don't but know there are subdirectories. Then you, you would just sit down computer, and type dir, you and type it tell dir. you what's there. I'm sorry. Why don't you wait for the question? You go to a computer you've never looked at before, and, you t and you're in DOS, and you type dir, directory. It will then bring up a list of all of the other directories, the subdirectories, and all of the files that are just loose files. They're not inside another directory. Exactly. OK. Now, let's say you don't go through the word processing program. Let's say you want to actually see the text of a particular file that's appeared on this list. What do you do? You're in DOS. Can you bring up text in DOS? You can. And what do you do to do that? Um, I would use a command called copy. I would do copy, space, and then the file name. Say the file name was called letter. If I wanted to see it on the screen, I would type C-O-P-Y space L-E-T-T-E-R space C-O-N and a colon, which says copy the contents of the file letter to my console, which is my screen. Which and means? it would display it onto, it would take and display it on the screen. Okay. So let's say that now you're at the Menendez computer and you want to see the content of this file that you've seen that has the name Will. Mm -hmm. And you do what you just described copy blank will con colon. Right. Okay? And then you would expect that what would come up on the screen is whatever is in that file, whatever that document called will is, correct? Depending on the word processor, yes. Okay. Certain word processors embed certain codes so that it doesn't just have the text, it has codes. And those codes may prevent it from, from being possible to just view on the screen this way. Did but you, you, would, you would, could get an approximation of the file in this fashion. Did you try that in order to read that file called will? Did you mm. try to read that file called will? Yes, I used a different kind of editor, not a DOS editor. I used one that would, it, I used one that is not sensitive to these other control codes, to the non-printable characters, the non, the non-letter information. Okay, let me just so ask I'm, a question about that. Word processing programs have a series of codes that look like complete hieroglyphics right. to the human eye, and every document created in in one of these word processing programs has these hidden codes. Right. You don't see them on the screen, but they're there. Right. It tells and, it, and if you try to read them through through DOS, I think what you're saying is sometimes you'll get on the screen those hieroglyphic codes right. instead of the alphabet typed out information. Right. 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 So you went in using um, something like Xtree. Um, I used where I used Xtree was to see what files existed. I probably used, and I don't recall exactly, I probably used IBM's professional editor. So you used one of these programs, and you wanted to see what was in this file, Will. And did you see what was in that file, Will? Yes, I did. And what was in that file, Will? What was in, in that file, Will, was a directory listing of one of the subdirectories. 
So it wasn't, it wasn't actually a document. No, not per se. Or if it was a document, it was a document that just had a list of, of, of file names. Of four file names or five file names. And did you do the same thing with the other headings of this? You said that you had seen several files. Whichever files were there that were on the list, I would did the same thing. Each of those files had the identical information in them. Which to the was best yet. of my recollection, they were each identical. And they were a directory. And they were a directory. And uh, do you recall now that when you looked at that, when you did this, I'll strike that. Do you recall now that when you first saw the directory on the screen that had these file names, that the files, or at least some of them, appeared to have been last worked on or last changed within a minute or so of each other? Yes, ma'am. And at that time, um, it was an old one when you saw it? Definitely. And at that time, when you would turn on one of those IBM XT computers, if you wanted it to keep track of the date, you'd have to actually tell it what the date was on that day that you turned the machine on. Right. The way an XT was designed, whenever you turned it on, it would think it was 1980, and then you would have to explicitly tell it the date. It is possible to put a special card in it that would make it have an ongoing clock. I don't know for sure whether or not one of those was, was in the machine. I wouldn't, don't recall that. So it could have had so a special card that would have acted like a continuous clock the way right. more modern computers act right. now. So all you'd have to turn it on and it would know And it would date. know whatever, I mean, relative to whatever date it thought it was yesterday, it would still be progressing. Assuming I don't there wasn't it. power outages and things like that. Battery failures and the like. Okay. So this could have been a computer that was keeping track of its own time, or it could have been a computer where you'd have to actually type in the date each day when you turned it on. Right. Okay. Now, do you recall that these files that you found, and you do remember at least one was called Will and one was called Menendez? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall that they appear to have the same date and a time of just one minute apart? Yes, ma'am. And, and what was the name of the subdirectory? I believe the subdirectory was called Menendez. Um, I don't recall that from the, the original time. I do recall that from where it was refreshed from an earlier exhibit that I was presented that seems to have been similar to one of those files. Aaron, I'm holding an exhibit that's been previously marked uh, 70. May I approach? Yes. Now, you have seen that exhibit before in this courtroom a little while ago. Yes, ma'am. And in looking at Exhibit 70, does Exhibit 70 appear to be similar to what you saw on the screen of the Menendez computer? Similar. You can't say that it's identical to what you saw, is that correct? Right. But you also can't say that it's totally different. Right. Was there a printer in the bedroom of this home where this uh, computer was? I don't recall, but I can look at the picture and tell you. Well. But I, I really don't. You can see a printer, but. Yeah, I, to tell you the truth, I really don't remember. Um, and I don't see one. No, yes, I do see one directly on top of the machine. So, there is so I would say that there is, in fact, a printer there. And the paper that Exhibit 70 is made up of, is that standard computer printout paper? It's standard wide carriage paper. And it is, in fact, the kind of paper that would more than likely have been used in this, this actual this printer that I see here. This is a wide carriage printer, so there's a, there's a, a good chance that this is the type of paper that they would have used. Okay. Generally, for home use, most people don't buy the wide carriage paper. Okay. Would it make sense to you um, if this was a computer, in fact, that had come from a business and then was taken home? Definitely possible. Let's look, then, at what's on Exhibit 70. And let's start with the first line. It says, C. Is that a greater than sign? Yes. C colon slash Menendez. Right. Okay. But what is that? Is that an attempt at a it's command? It's a totally meaningless attempt at a command. You have to keep Sorry. talking with the microphone. It's, a, it's a, an attempt at a command. It's attempting to execute a program called Menendez. Okay. And it doesn't work because it's not a proper command. It's not a proper command. Now, the next line says DOS, does it not? Yes. And next to that, it's in parentheses, it says directory. Yes, ma'am. Now, what is that? That is identifying a subdirectory called DOS. Okay. So that whatever this listing is, this listing is a snippet of another directory listing. And you can tell from the, this that it's not a full list. This list said there should be 70 files, yet we see only six files. Uh, actually, I think it says 90 no, files. Sorry, 90 files, and we see only six. Okay, so but it's showing you DOS directory, and that is a valid thing that would show up on a screen? Yes. And that shows a creation or a last worked upon date, does it not? Yes. And that date is January 20th, 1986? Yes. And it has a time of 12.25 p.m.? Yes. Okay. Now, the next thing here is something called Xtree, or the symbol for something called Xtree. Right. And is Xtree a type of program? Xtree is a type of program, but if it were the program Xtree, it should say Xtree.exe, not plain Xtree. Plain okay. Xtree, again, is meaningless. Okay, but it, nevertheless, it shows a number of characters, or right. it shows that this Xtree, whatever it is, has data in it. Yes. If it is a program, if it's a program like Xtree, where it's a purchase program, it will show the last date that the publisher worked on the program before they shipped it. But again, those dates aren't always real. If you look at the current copy of Microsoft Windows, which is a program that 
didn't exist until 1993. There are several files in it that are dated 87 and 88. So it's, or just, I mean, those, those date stamps and time stamps, as often as not, are meaningless and irrelevant. In those programs? In, in many, many store-bought programs. Okay, let's get back to this, though. You think that this X tree is not really a program, but what, a document? No, it looks like a corrupted file. I mean, the X tree is a program, but X tree should be X tree EXE or X tree COM. Okay, the next line is uh, the word, it appears to be guest, G U E S T. It's also the name of a directory. And that's a directory, and that shows a date of March 25th, 88, and a time of 9.43 a.m. Does that mean that's when that directory was created on this computer? Most likely. I mean, looking at also the one that's almost more indicative is a DOS directory is generally one of the first things that you create when you set up a new machine. So if, theoretically, this were the direct, a piece of the directory from the main directory, and it had not been changed or modified or corrupted, it would imply that, and if they had set the date correctly when they first set the machine up, it would imply that this machine was first set up in 1988. Okay, but then we were but, about to hit a, a row of three things that all have dates of 1987 on them. As I said, most of the dates are irrelevant. I mean, with an XT, okay. it's very hard to get anything from the dates. What's along with this? Because what, what we do have now is entries that have different dates, not all, and none of them are 1980, is that correct? None of these are 1980. All right, now let's go to the next entry. Under guest, which is a directory, we now have three files, Will, Menendez, and List. Is right. That correct? Now, are they files under the guest directory? No, they are not. All right, so they're just separate files. They're separate files in the main directory, okay. or this snippet of the main directory. Now, according to this printout, the Will file has 59 bytes, or 59 characters. Right. The Menendez file has 59 bytes or characters. Right. And the List file has 59 bytes or characters. Yes, ma'am. All three of these files have the same date, January 13th, 1987. Yes. And all three of them appear to have been last worked upon or created, whichever it is, a minute apart. One at 4.58 a.m., one at 4.59 a.m., and one at 5 a.m. Right. It had no significant information, but the identical information. In it. That's the way I recall it, yes. And that's what that looks like, three files with identical information created at or near the same time. Yes. Now, 59 bytes, if you translate that, let's assume it's text. If you translate that into words, how many words would 59 bytes be? Seven, eight, I mean, if you figure, you know, eight, an average of eight characters per word, 10 words. Okay. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. May I have a question? Yes. Uh, Mr. Whitney, you have in front of you an exhibit, which is marked as Exhibit 70. Um, is there any way to tell from looking at this exhibit the date and time that it's actually prepared? No, there's no way to tell. Uh, now, I believe you indicated that certain kinds of computers have built-in clocks and other types of computers, the older models, you have to tell the computer what time it is. Is that right. correct? Right. And even those with built-in clocks, you can chain, override the time with a, one command. You type date and tell it the date, and as far as it's concerned, it will be that date. So I could go home and tell my computer tonight that it's 1972. Right. And in fact, for accounting systems, you'll find people often do that. They'll, they will reset their accounting system to a prior quarter or to a prior month so that they can continue. They can fool the computer into thinking it's one date so they can go back and enter things in the past and then reset it to a current date. So it's a, it's a, a very, very simple thing to do. So um, if I wanted to, I could go home. Well, let me ask you this. Could I go home tonight if I had one of these um, printers that took this kind of paper and actually create this document? Absolutely. How long do you think it would take me? Well, not, not knowing as much as you do, but how long would it take to create something like that? Your Honor, I'm going to object to how long it would take counsel since how long would the counsel be developed? Okay, how long would it take you, Mr. Wickham? Mm, Ten minutes, five minutes. So you could recreate everything on this by telling the computer different times and dates and then in putting that into the computer and then printing it out. Right. Now, according to um, this document, 70, there appears to be these three files, and they have 59 bytes. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you work on a file. If you change the file, it will put a new time and date stamp on the file. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to go stand over here so you look at the jury. Sorry. And you indicated 59 bytes was anywhere from 8 to 10 words. If the file previously had contained, let's say, 20,000 bytes, and you went back and changed it to very few words, would there be any indication that the file previously had 20,000 bytes? None at all. Uh, could you tell the jury briefly what bytes are? Um, characters or letters. I mean, if I took, if I took a 20,000 word document and I just copied a directory over it, it would replace that document with the directory and there would, there would be no record that it had ever cre contained anything other than that directory. You'd write right over the top of it. It would have a new time stamp, a new date. It would have a new file size. And the information that had previously been held in that file each individual letter, the letters would be written over and gone. If you wanted to eliminate, if you wanted to erase the file and erase it in a way that's non-recoverable, the best way to do so isn't to tell it to delete the file, but to write something else over the top of it. Would you need to write over all 20,000 characters, or could you just write a few characters? If you wrote, if you didn't write over all 20,000, 
the characters could still exist on the disk. They wouldn't be associated with any file. They would just be sitting on the disk. But the next file, the way DOS allocates new memories, the next time you created a file, it would go right over the top of whatever space you had just freed up. Generally, as you free up space, that will be the next space used. So if I had a 20,000 byte file, copied a 59 byte file over it, it would erase the first 512, don't ask me why, but it just it would create the first block and leave the rest of the data there. But every other file that you wrote would go right over the top of whatever other data was sitting out on the disk. And thereby erase it. And thereby erase it. So it's, it's one, of the best, one of the best ways to eliminate the information. Now, you use the term corrupted file. Could you tell us what that means? A corrupted file, the computers aren't, a computer isn't perfect. It stores, the way it stores information is it takes, uh, there's a metal platter, a hard disk is a metal platter coated with this, with kind of a rubberized magnetic film. And the way it stores information is it just magnetizes it. It magnetizes the file film one direction or the other. So you can get something called a hard disk crash. You can destroy data or damage a computer. If you drop the computer, you bang into the computer. You know, there's numerous things that will force it to scratch the, the electronic media. You can put a magnet next to it. There's numerous things that will force, that will allow it to change the information kind of in an inconsistent fashion, and you'll end up with a file that no longer is a meaningful file. It may still have the name, it may still be on the directory, but the information that it used to contain is no longer of any validity. And that's what you mean by corrupted. And that's what I mean by corrupted. Uh, lastly, the um, exhibit in front, in front of you, number 70, did you create that exhibit? No, I did not. Do you have any knowledge personal as to where it came from? Um, I've actually seen, I saw it here today, and I've seen a, a previous copy that was sent to me by a private investigator working for one of the other, one of the defense counsels. But as far as your personal knowledge of where that came from, you have no idea, is that correct? No, ma'am. Thank you. Any further cross? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Mr. Whitkin, your understanding of computers is on the high end of sophisticated, is it not? I hope so. In looking at Exhibit 70 and that um, the first entry on it, uh, you said that was a totally meaningless set of commands, correct? Um, on 70, the first command is C colon Menendez. So theoretically, they could have named a program Menendez, yep. but it's... You said that was an ineffectual command. Right. I'm assuming this, it's an ineffectual, right, typing it is, is basically meaningless. Unless they've created a program called Menendez, it's meaningless. But seeing what it's producing immediately thereafter, it's pretty much meaningless. Okay, but my point is it does not look like a person with your level of computer sophistication created typed this that document. First, created that document, no, correct? Okay. I mean, just looking also, if you look at the continuation, where there are another half a dozen attempts at issuing it as a command. When you say the continuation, there are, there's more written there's on There's more that written on this page than the directory. Can, you've got to wait for the question. Yeah, oh, sorry. so let him finish the answer before you ask your next question. Did you finish your answer? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. My question was, there, there's more uh, material on that printout than those files that I took you through a little while ago. Yes, ma'am, there is. All right, and below those files, there seems to be a series of attempts by someone who is not as sophisticated as you to call up some files from the computer. Yes, ma'am. Correct, and they're not doing it right. No, ma'am, they're not. So that does not exhibit, does it, to you a high level of understanding of how this computer works? No, ma'am. There is one just in the Sorry, way... Sorry, you answered the question. Sorry. Okay. Now, you say that there is this method to write over and on top of a file. Does that come in some? Uh, does that come in the DOS book that you get for a computer? Does it tell you how to do that? I'm not sure. Is that something that um, your word processing program book will tell you? Your word processing book will definitely tell you because it'll tell you how to avoid doing so, so that you don't damage your documents. So this is something that people stumbling around can sometimes do and damage their documents or something someone very sophisticated can do to hide a file. Is Definitely that correct? possible, yes. Now let's take someone very sophisticated like yourself. If someone had made an effort to write over a 20,000 byte file with a 59 byte file, um, what you're saying is you wouldn't be able to find that previous 20,000 bytes as a file, but they're still on that disk, aren't they? Possibly. And there are utility programs and tools that you could use to try to find that data. Which is what I did. Yes. And you didn't find it, did you? No, ma'am, I did not. Nothing further. Can I have one question? Yes. Um, Mr. Wigan, on Exhibit 70, there are the three files that you made reference to are one minute apart. Yes, ma'am. What does that signify to you, please? Um, a conscious effort to write over the, 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 that it was not a corrupted file that produced those small files, that whatever data those files had contained, they, did, they do not contain this data through corruption, that it was a conscious effort <coughs> to copy whatever information is in them into them. When you say a conscious effort to copy whatever information is in them, 
uh, to them. Uh, what did you mean? Good question. What did that uh, mean? There, you can look at a pro you can look at a file that's that's damaged for whatever reason, and try to decide whether that file, if the, if that whether the file is damaged through just the disk itself failing <coughs> through, through a fluke of something that one of the things just happened on the computer or whether it took active intervention. Whether it was purposeful intervention or accidental intervention, you couldn't create these files in this format without a person consciously intervening to create those files. Whether he knew that's what he was doing or not, I can't say, but it takes a conscious, I mean, a conscious effort to create these three files, same size, same data, one right after the other. And you indicated that there was a date for all of these, and they were one minute apart. Is that right? Yes, sir. And I'm referring now to when you look at the computer screen, not the exhibit before you. I, that I don't recall. I'm sorry. All right. Do you uh, recall what the time frame was uh, regarding those four files? You had indicated. Uh, I remember when I saw them. I remember it striking me that they were basically identical times. But whether they were all one minute apart or two minutes apart, I remember it struck me at that time that they were done sequentially. But I don't remember now the exact the exact time sequence. Was there any indication as to the date they were done? I don't remember what that date would have been. I don't recall. Was there some reason why you didn't pay attention to the date that uh, these events occurred or as they were reflected on the screen anyway? Because um, as I said, as a general rule on an XT, date stamps are meaningless. Only be because you have, because it doesn't hold the date, because every time you turn it on you have to type in a date, they're generally, generally random. They're generally not meaningful on an XT. So right. for the most part you just ignore them. Is that what you did? Just ignore them. All right, anything else? Uh, just to clarify on the court's question, if I can ask from here, Your Honor. I just want to see if I understand your answer to the judge's question. When you say conscious, it means a person had to hit some keys on the computer, whether they knew what they were doing or didn't know what they were doing. They had to hit the keys on the computer to create files that look like this. Right. As compared to lightning strikes the building and your computer blows out and that destroys Exactly. You. Thank you. All right, anything else? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. You may step down. You're excused. Thank, thank you, sir. sir. Uh, I was thinking he was a grandfather, but um, the, there was a, a killing, and he wanted me to come up and look at a computer. He apparently had been there a couple of days earlier and looked at the uh, computer and saw some files, um, stated that one of them was perhaps Menendez, um, something about maybe some documents and about a will. Uh, he tried to find it, information in that, but he didn't have the technical expertise or didn't know how to, so he wanted someone uh, from Calco to come up and see if we could retrieve any information. Now, Carlos Menendez uh, worked for Merck, which you indicated is a parent company for Calco? That's correct. Uh, Merck and Company is headquartered in New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> headquartered in New Jersey. Uh, Calco is a specialty chemical division of Merck. Uh, we're headquartered in San Diego. And that call was on August 31st, 1989? That is correct. Did you uh, drive up to Beverly Hills the next day? Yes. Um, it seemed imperative, or he was real concerned that I get up there as soon as possible. Uh, he, won't, he was real anxious about finding any of the information on there. And he asked, and I said, well, I could come up the next morning. Um, went ahead and cleared that with my boss and, and made plans to take that day off and go up to Beverly Hills. And did you do so? I did so, yes. What time did you arrive at Beverly Hills? Um, I left um, close and I arrived in Beverly Hills just around 11 o'clock, uh, somewhere at that time. Um, was able to find the house um, without pretty much any difficulty and went to the door and, and had a difficult time initially getting in there. Was that at 722 North Elm Drive in Beverly Hills? That is correct. The Menendez house? That is correct. Now, when you originally arrived there, um, what did you see? Was someone waiting for you? Um, there was no one there. There's, I know there's, when I initially got there, there were some cars along, and I was able to park almost right in front of the house. Um, I did have my wife with me at the time, and we both got out of the car and approached the front door. Um, I believe I, I knocked or something, and there was a security um, guard or someone who met me there and stated that, you know, asked what I was doing there. I said I was supposed to come up here and take a look at the computer. He said that I was not on any list. He didn't know who I was, and he told me if I needed to do that, that I needed to call the um, Bel Air Patrol or whatever security company and uh, make sure that they granted permission for me to go there. Did you then make some phone calls? Yes, I did. What did you do? Um, my wife and I went back in the car, and we drove up to Sunset. Um, I, went and found a pay phone just to, uh, not too far away and proceeded to make a series of calls. I first called the, um, the Bel Air Patrol, or the Bel Air Security Company, and they didn't know any, had never heard of me. They didn't know of me being supposed to be on a list. Uh, they said if I was indeed supposed to and that Carlos was the person that said he would put me on that list, I needed to get hold of Carlos so that he could call them in. Um, I then tried to call Carlos back in New Jersey. I um, was unsuccessful at reaching him at the office. I had his home number. I tried calling him there. I uh, was initially unsuccessful there and waited a little bit, tried later. Um, probably about 45 minutes of time elapsed when I finally got hold of him, and he said that Eric was there waiting for me at the house to go there right away, in which in case I did. Okay, so you returned to the Menendez house? That is correct. Now, you indicated that you had your wife with you? Yes, I did. Is she also a computer expert? Uh, she is not. Um, she's a housewife. Um, at the time, she was eight months pregnant. 
and I don't know why I brought her up there, but we just thought we'd, you know, I didn't know of anything about the case of any, uh, any unusual circumstances. Uh, so I was thinking maybe after I was done, I'd go ahead and, you know, have lunch up here. We'd spend the afternoon here. So, so you does not have any computer knowledge at all. No. Okay. You don't normally bring your wife on your uh, calls? Um, it's very infrequent that I ever travel, actually, with my job. I support mainly the employees at the business site itself. Mr. Heyman, after you returned to uh, 722 North Elm, after you had made the calls back to New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, was anyone waiting for you at that point? Um, Eric was up there at the front door, um, and there was another gentleman with him at that time, and we both came up. When you say Eric uh, was at the front door, just um, for purposes of the record, yeah. would you identify who you're referring to? Yeah. Eric Menendez sitting over here in the blue and white shirt. Referring to the defendant at council table. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, you indicated that he had another person with him? That is correct. Uh, was it, uh, would you describe that person just generally? Was it a young person? Yeah, it was a young person, I'd say roughly um, same age, um, obviously a friend. Um, and it, well, I, I was introduced to him I know, at that time along with my wife, um, but I would say that, that was Craig. Have you seen this particular person uh, since you were there September 1st, 1989? Um, I had seen him probably a few months after the incident and some of the publicity on the TV and had recognized him at that time. And my wife and I said, yeah, that's the gentleman we saw with Eric. Um, we re I really hadn't seen much of him since then and had long forgotten his name. Um, but however, with the publicity recently, I have seen pictures of him uh, of late, and that is, and, and Craig is the person that was there at that time. That's Craig Signorelli? Craig Signorelli, yes. Now, would you describe for the jurors what happened as you went up to the house and you saw the defendant, mm -hmm. Eric Menendez, with his friend, Craig Signorelli? Yeah, um, he greeted us at the door, and I said, you know, I'm Ed Heyman, and I was to take a look at the computer, and he was obviously well aware of why I was there, and he basically led me into the house. Um, I just went right past any security was there, and we went upstairs into the master bedroom. Uh, he showed me where the computer was there to the right, uh, just inside that entrance, and I basically proceeded to turn on the computer, um, sat in the chair there with my wife next to me, and start looking at the, the files itself. Um, I initially started off by doing just a command at the DOS prompt called DIR, or directory listing, just to see what was there. Um, there were not many subdirectories or files there at that time. I then went ahead and proceeded to use uh, some utilities from Norton uh, Utilities, one of which the first one I used was Quick Undelete. That's a utility used to try and undelete any directories or sub any files that are there. Um, the files, there was really nothing there worth interest, so I went to a more advanced utility uh, called Norton Utilities, whereby I can actually see um, the directory listing, um, the FAT table, or the uh, file allocation table, as well as each sector uh, individually. And I spent probably two hours uh, looking at one sector at a time, just seeing. I, I figured I was up there from San Diego. I'll do my best to see if I can find anything. Did you fi find anything under the titles Menendez or Will? Um, I did not. Um, some of the files that I did see there was a directory for DOS, which is basic operating system on the PC. Um, there was a couple other small application programs that really didn't mean anything. The one data file that I really did see was had been deleted, but I was able to find it. Um, it I mean, it was still there. A um, couple paragraphs that seemed to be like a, um, a book report or something of the Renaissance period or something like that time frame. Um, I continue going through the rest of the hard disk. Um, there was no files that could be seen that were deleted that could have been retrieved at that point. Was there anything on the computer which indicated to you that someone had deleted something on the computer? Yes. Um, as I was going through the computer, um, it was an older one, so I'd assumed it had been there for a couple of years, or for a while, I shouldn't say that. Um, but there's a formatting that when you initially use the DOS operating system to format and prepare a hard disk for people to write to, um, it puts a code F6 throughout the entire disk. Um, the way I like to think of an analogy is if you had a blank piece of paper, when you format it, you're putting the lines across so that you can then write in there and understand it. Um, as I was looking through it, the code that was there was all zero, so that tended to tell me that um, whatever was deleted had been wiped out and they overwrote the entire hard disk with uh, the character zero, zero. Is that indicative of a certain type of uh, program? Um, I wouldn't say a certain type of program, but it would mean that it was not just a normal uh, format that had occurred from the DOS command when you normally prepare hard disk. So to me, it means that that hard disk had been used, um, and for whatever reason, files <clears throat> or the hard disk was cleaned up using that utility. Probably a utility like Norton's wipe disk or wipe file. The Norton wipe disk or file, does it replace the F6s with the uh, zeros? Um, it can replace it with whatever you want, but the default is zeros. And the wipe disk will actually, the parameter that I would say was used would not delete any files that still existed. In other words, wiping the whole hard disk would just wipe out anything uh, that had been deleted or had not been used, and it would write zeros over everything. Mr. Heyman, while you were uh, accessing the computer, uh, do you know where Eric Menendez was at that point? Um, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, I would say he was there. Um, 
for the most part at my site, kind of watching, and he was asking a few questions of what I was doing. Um, <clears throat> wanted to know if I was able to find any files that may have been deleted. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, at that time, and um, I generally had the feeling at that moment that he was. Um, yeah, Objecting. Yeah. Right. Just uh, wait for another question. Certainly. What was his demeanor at this point while you're initially accessing the computer? Um, I would say that he was very cordial. He didn't seem um, anxious or apprehensive or about me being there. Um, he seemed somewhat curious of you know what I was doing, looking over, watching me doing that. Uh, but as he was calm and matter of fact. At some point uh, after doing your initial search, did you have any conversation with uh, the defendant? Um, well, he was asking me um, some questions as you're going on, wondering um, if files were deleted, can you retrieve them? And I replied that uh, yes, files can be retrieved when they're normally deleted if it's just like a DOS delete. Uh, the reason for that is DOS simply writes over a special character in the first character of the name of a file in a directory listing. So under those circumstances, yes, most deleted files can be retrieved. Uh, if the computer hasn't been used for a long time after that. He, he specifically asked you that question about uh, whether if something had been uh, deleted, whether it could be retrieved? That's correct. Was your wife present when you made that statement to him and he responded? Yes, she was. Do you recall any conversation between the defendant, Eric Menendez, and his friend, Craig Signorelli, at that point? Um, at that point, I do not recall or believe that Craig was really right there near us at the time. Um, we were there for an extended period of time and I know that they had come back a couple of times and then um, I spent some a little time with them after the fact when we went to call Carlos to let him know the results. Um, but I do recall them talking about different things, um, cars, I, I was any person? Objection, Your Honor. Objection sustained in that it's not responsive to ask the next Mr. Heyman, what was it that uh, you heard in your presence uh, Eric Menendez talking about? Objection, relevance. Um, Can answer. On grounds of relevancy? On the grounds of 402. All right, you may. All right, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Heyman, after you were at the uh, Menendez house for a couple of hours trying to uh, find information about the will, uh, you did you complete your, your search? Um, I went ahead and looked around on that desk for any floppy disks, uh, thinking, well, maybe there might have been something on a floppy disk, a backup copy or something like that. Um, I found a few right there where the computer was. Um, I looked at them, searched at them. There was nothing of any value there. Um, there was another desk um, on the other side of the bed. Um, I went over there and just looked on the top and in a couple of drawers and realized well, I probably shouldn't be doing this and, and stopped and just went back and basically um, completed my search at that time, um, realizing that I had not found anything that um, Carlos had wanted me to come look for. And did you report that back to Carlos Menendez? Uh, yes. Um, Eric had come up um, with Craig and was wondering how things were doing. I basically said I think I was done and needed to use the phone. Uh, we went downstairs. Um, they kind of showed me around the house real quick at that point, just showing me the home. And we went into the kitchen. Um, in the back there was a phone there that we used. Um, I called Carlos and told him that I was unable to find um, such directories that he thought were there or any files of this other like. Um, he was a little upset at me. He wanted, you know, kept insisting, is there any way that <clears throat> you could retrieve anything if it was deleted? And I tried to explain to him that if it had just been deleted, yes, I might have been able to. But it, in my opinion, it looked like another program was used to clean the hard disk. And, I, and as a result of that, there was nothing I could do um, to retrieve any files that may have been there if there were, in fact, any there. If the um, Norton wipe disk had been used, mm -hmm. say, the day before, uh, would, you been, would you have been able to retrieve anything the next day, the day that you were there? No, I would not have been. Would it be fair to say that uh, Defendant Eric Menendez and his friend Craig Signorelli were in and out of the room where you were accessing the computer during this two-hour stay that you had? That is correct. Uh, at one point, they came up and they um, invited my wife to show her the house while I was sitting there working on the computer, and they were gone for several minutes. As he, he took them, I think, in the different rooms and showed them some of the different areas of the home. When you left uh, after um, trying to search for the uh, will information, uh, was, was Eric still at the house when you left the house? Uh, yes, he was. Was Craig Signorelli still there? Yes, he was. Nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Good morning, Mr. Heyman. Good morning. The uh, information you got from Carlos Menendez was that he had recently been in Los Angeles. Is mm -hmm. that correct? That is correct. And did Mr. Menendez tell you that he had been to the house and looked at this computer himself? Yes, he did. Uh, did he tell you when he had been in Los Angeles? Um, he said that it was a couple of days earlier and that he had to come back because of business. Now, do you recall Carlos Menendez telling you anything that he saw on the computer? 
Um, he said that he saw or a file or a directory, Menendez, uh, Will, and something else like documents. Okay. The third one being documents? Documents, yes. Okay. I assume he may have meant like a subdirectory that might have had just personal files in there, like a word processor. Did Carlos Menendez also tell you that although he had looked at the computer and found these directories, he didn't know how to retrieve them? That is correct. Okay. Uh, did it appear to you from your conversation with him that Carlos Menendez was not uh, knowledgeable about computers? Um, it, it sounded like he definitely was not, um, or at least didn't know the programs or did not, was not very knowledgeable, that's correct. All right, he, he was not able apparently to access these directories himself. Um, I had assumed that he at least had some basic knowledge of computers, he was able to turn it on and do some type of directory that he saw those files, but didn't know what word processor is an example to use to pull the data up. Okay, and you, you had no way of uh, knowing how accurate the information that he was giving you about what he saw on the computer was. Would that be fair to say? That is correct. Okay. Uh, so that your job was to go up and to try and find out what was on the computer and retrieve it and give it to Carlos. That is correct. During the conversation that you had with Carlos Menendez on August 31st, uh, were, were you told that Eric would meet you at the house? Yes, I was. And he would, that Eric would be the one that would let you into the house? Um, yeah, he also said that he would contact uh, security there to make sure that I was on the list so that I would be able to enter. So you were aware when you went up there that there was some kind of a security company that was at the residence and maintaining uh, control over who went in and out? That's correct. And when you arrived on September 1st, you found out that Carlos Mendez apparently had not uh, put your name on the list for the security company? That is correct. And that was what caused you to uh, have to go to the phone booth and make the phone calls, correct? Correct. Uh, did you ask for Eric when you first arrived on uh, September 1st, when you were not allowed access? Um, I couldn't say specifically remembering now. I, I would imagine I would have asked in that was name, but I don't recall. Do you recall uh, talking to the police about this uh, in May of 1990? That's correct. Okay. And when you were interviewed to the police, do you recall telling them that when you first went there, you were told by the security guard that Eric wasn't at home? Um, that's probably correct, yes. But you don't have any present recollection of that being the case? Um, well, I'm, I would assume that if Eric was there that I would have been informed of that and I would have been let in, yes. Okay. Because I, I know there's no one there to vouch for me. No one knew I was coming. No one saw me on a list or anything. And your understanding was that Eric was going to be there to vouch for you and to say it was okay for you to come in? That's correct. Now, when you uh, returned after your phone calls to New Jersey, uh, you found Eric was waiting for you? That is correct. And was he waiting uh, in the front yard? Um, I would say he was there at the fr at the, out on the front porch waiting there. And at that time you said that he was with a friend? Correct. Uh, when you met with Eric, uh, did you go immediately up to the master bedroom? Um, yes, I would say we did. And then you started right away to work on the computer, is that, that is, right? That is correct. And this was a computer uh, that had uh, that was located in the master bedroom. Correct. Uh, was there a, uh, a computer stand with a chair in front of it? Um, yeah, they had. A, it was a computer desk or something of that sort. Um, it was an IBM PC, and they had a big sofa chair that was sitting in front that I was sitting in. Yes. Okay. Now, when you first uh, got in and sat down, uh, were you able to tell fairly quickly uh, that this computer uh, didn't have anything on it? Um, after turning it on and issuing the first command DIR at the root drive, um, I could see immediately that the files were, or files or directories were not there. And so at that point, I tried to use some utilities to see if they'd been deleted and I could retrieve it. All right. So uh, this is something, the, the lack of any files or directories on the computer was something that you were able to ascertain right away. That is correct. And uh, during, when you ascertained this, when you discovered it, did you tell Eric what you had discovered? Um, well, he, I, I um, I know that we were talking, and I know that, um, you know, he asked if, I, I probably stated that I don't see any of the files that Carlos asked me to look for, um, and then I recalled him asking, well, if they're deleted, can you find them? Okay, so when he asked you that if they were deleted, can you find them, that was after you had told him that there was nothing on the computer, correct? Um, to the best of my knowledge, that is probably how it happened, yes. Okay, and you said that Eric and his friend were in there for about 10 or 15 minutes with you, and then they kind of wandered off. Correct. Um, I would recommend the first... 10, 15 minutes that uh, Eric was the one that I really remember being there at that time because he was standing next to me. Um, Craig may have wandered off earlier or later. Yeah. Right. And it was during this first 10 or 15 minutes when Eric was standing by you that you talked. You told him that the files had been deleted and he asked you whether or not they could be retrieved even if they had been deleted. Is That's that correct. correct? Now, did there... Did there come a time when your wife left the bedroom? Yes, there was. Okay, and 
about how long after you had uh, arrived at the house did your wife leave the bedroom? Um, I guess maybe a half an hour, something like that. Okay, so it was uh, relatively soon into your two hours at the residence, correct? That's correct. And did your wife uh, leave the bedroom in order to take a tour of the house? That's correct. She was invited to look at the house by Eric. Eric invited her? Correct. And they left for some period of time? That is correct. Uh, how long were they gone? Um, I would guess uh, several minutes, something like that. Okay. Was the friend there when Eric invited your wife to, to come and look at the house? Yes, he was. And do you uh, recall the friend leaving to look at the house along with your wife and Eric? Um, yes, I would say he did. Now let's talk about uh, the friend for a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, you called him uh, by name today as Craig. That is correct. Uh, and to the best of your knowledge, when you were at the house on September 1st, uh, were you introduced to the friend? Yes, we were. And you knew his name on September 1st, 1989, right? That would be correct, yes. Okay. Uh, when you were interviewed by the police on May 7th, 1990, uh, did you tell them about the friend? Yes, I did. Okay. And were you able in May of 1990 to tell the police what the friend's name was? I was not. Okay, because no. you had forgotten it, right? Because I'd forgotten and I've never been someone who's real good with names, period. Okay. Oh, turn them. Right. And uh, when you, were you interviewed by uh, a defense investigator named Cynthia Eardley and Ms. Abramson uh, in March of 1993. Can you see her over there? Yes, I see her down there. <laughs> okay. And yes, I was interviewed by her at that time. And when you talked to uh, them in March of 1993, uh, were you able to recall the name of the friend at that time? At that time, I had not. So something has happened between, say, uh, 1993 in March and today that caused you to remember the name? That is correct. And is that uh, seeing the person in the newspapers? Um, on television. On television. So you saw a person on television who uh, described the incident that you're now telling us about, right? No, um, it just mentioned his name, that he was uh, involved with the trial and testifying. It did not have to talk about his statement or anything he was saying in that trial. Okay, and what, uh, I believe you said television? Correct. What television was it that um, you looked at? It was one of the primetime shows. Um, it would have been a couple weeks ago. I was up in Portland at the time when I saw that. And that's when I saw the face and it just clicked that was him. Okay. Um, now let uh, me ask you about what uh, the person that you saw uh, on September 1st looked like. Uh, you were able to see this person standing next to Eric, correct? That is correct. And can you tell us now whether the person that you saw on September 1st was about the same size as Eric or different? Um, I would say he would be similarly built, as, as I recall, maybe a little shorter, but um, he was, did not stand out in any great difference. Okay. Similarly built to who? To Eric Menendez. Mm -hmm. Slender, you know, young. Uh, you recall this person as being slender? To the best of my knowledge now, yes, I do. Was he heavier than Eric? Um, perhaps slightly. I, I really couldn't give you an answer. You really don't have a, a good memory of the friend? correct? Not a great memory. I mean, I, most of my time concentrated was on the computer. Okay. What about the friend's hair color? Do you recall uh, how uh, his, uh, what color his hair was? Um, I was, well, my recollection right now is probably going to be tainted because of seeing it on TV. I'm going to say it's a Sandy Brown, but to me it was the face. I saw it and that was him. I mean, that's all I saw on television. When you were interviewed on March 31st, 1993 by Cynthia Erdley and Ms. Abramson, mm -hmm. Uh, did you tell them that the person that you saw with Eric had a heavier build than Eric? Um, we may have. I think my, well. Okay, and was uh, this heavier build uh, your best recollection on March 31st, 1993? That could be, yes. Okay, and that was also your best recollection before uh, you saw this television show, right? Um, I was never asked to describe and never really thought about it much before that, no. Okay, but before you saw the television show, your best recollection was that the friend had a heavier build than Eric. Perhaps, yes. Okay. Did you also uh, tell Miss Abramson and Cynthia Airdley that the friend's hair color was lighter than Eric's? Uh, yes, we did believe it was. Okay, and uh, that was uh, your best recollection as of March of 1993? Correct. Okay, and uh, that was your best recollection before you saw the television show, correct? Um, I would say yes, but I mean it was not something we thought of very much. It's been a long time. 
Well, you, you've said, Mr. Heyman, that you think that you may be influenced somewhat by the television show and seeing the person on TV. Well, in my description, perhaps speaking now versus when I did March 31st, yes. Okay. What about the uh, eyes of the friend? Do you remember what color eyes he had? I do not. Okay. Did you tell uh, Ms. Abramson and Cynthia Erdely that uh, this friend had light-colored eyes? Uh, my wife and I were both speaking together. We may, she may have, I may have. I don't recall okay. that. But in any event, that's not your uh, recollection of how you described the friend. That's correct. Now, I think you described Eric that day as being cordial. Yes, he was very polite. Um, you know, welcomed us right into the house, took me right to the computer. Okay. And he was rather matter-of-fact about uh, the events that day? That's correct. Okay. Uh, did you also, Mr. Heyman, um, tell us that this was an older model computer? Yes. Okay. Uh, and what you found on the computer was, uh, you believe, to be a book report? It looked something like that, just by the what it was about, yes. Was that like a, a high school report that you'd do for a class? That was my impression, yes. Okay. And were you able to access that book report? Uh, yes, I was. Like I say, it was, a, it was a few paragraphs long, and that was it. Now, you said that after searching on the computer for a period of about two hours, you then mm -hmm. uh, said that you needed to use the phone. That's correct. And you uh, were taken down to the kitchen. Correct. Was uh, the friend with you when you went down to the kitchen? Yes, he was. And it was in the kitchen that you uh, called Carlos Menendez? That is correct. Was the friend with you when you made the phone call to Carlos Menendez? I was, yes, he was. Okay, so he was right there? That is correct. And uh, he was there when uh, you had this conversation with Carlos, and mm -hmm. Carlos was uh, upset, correct? Yes, he was, yeah. He had hoped that I would be able to give him some information or tell him that I found it. Okay. And uh, Carlos also said that he wanted to talk to Eric. That is correct. He did talk to Eric. And you put Eric on the phone? That is correct. And then you remained for some period of time while Eric and Carlos appeared to have a conversation? That is correct. And during this conversation, uh, Eric was saying certain things to Carlos? Yeah. Um, it, it sounded to me that um, Eric or Carlos was real mad at Eric, and I thought they got in a fight. The voices got louder, or at least on Eric's side, I could tell that he was um, being defensive and I don't want to say yelling, but something like that. And he did make this statement to the fact that um, I don't know what happened or it's not my fault. I didn't do it. Okay. And when Eric was having this um, defensive conversation with Carlos, was the friend also there? Yes, he was. So he was able to see and hear this as well? Um, to my collection, yes, he would have been. Because he was right there in the kitchen. What's the answer? Oh, yes. I'm sorry about that. Is it also correct, Mr. Heyman, that Eric did not appear to be apprehensive about you or what you were doing there uh, on September 1st? Um, yeah, that was my overall impression. I mean, we initially came in there. He greeted us warmly. Um, he basically left me alone for the most part of the time that I was there and was just in and out, um, wasn't hovering over or anything. He was very cordial and polite to us, offered my wife a glass of water and things. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. May I just have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. All right. Any redirect on these matters? Mr. Heyman, uh, May 7th, 1990, was that the first time that you had spoken to the police uh, regarding this case? Yes, it is. And do you recall which detective you spoke to? Was it Linehan or Zoller? Um, Linehan. On that date, you gave them information uh, regarding the friend being with Eric. That's that correct. Date. That is correct. That is uh, September 1st? Correct. Now, you indicated that you're not good with names. That is so correct. Sometime after after uh, being at Menendez's house and meeting um, mm -hmm. Eric Menendez and his friend, did you see this friend on television? Um, it was a few months after. It was, I would assume, a, a hard copy type show or something. And my wife and I were watching TV, and we did see him. And we both said that was the friend who was with uh, Eric when we were up there. And that was Craig Signorelli? And that was Craig Signorelli. Yes. Now, you referred to another uh, time when you saw something on television more recently. That is correct. Is that correct? And you indicated that the defense came to interview you on I think the date was uh, March 31st of 93? That is correct. Sometime after um, speaking with, with uh, Ms. Abramson and their investigator, did you see um, Craig Signorelli again on television? Yes, I did. Okay. You indicated that although you're not good with names, you are good with faces. Is that correct? Yes. Is it your testimony that the person that was with Eric Menendez 
on uh, September 1st, 1989, was Craig Signorelli. Yes, that is my testimony. Here, I have a photograph. It appears to be in the uh, bedroom uh, with a TV set and a computer in the background. I have this marked as uh, the next exhibit in order, which is 63. Yes. Thank you. Any question? Yes. So, David, I'll show you what's been marked as uh, Exhibit 63. Do you recognize what's shown in that photograph? Uh, yes, I do. What does that appear to be? Um, in the corner of the room is an IBM PC that I worked at along with the uh, sofa chair that I had sat in. Uh, we pulled that over in front. So, that's the computer. Would it be fair to say that when you were working on the computer that you were actually facing the computer? That is correct. So you were facing the corner of that particular room? Yes, I was facing the corner of the room. When you were talking to uh, Eric Menendez, mm -hmm. uh, did you have your back to him? Um, yeah, I was facing the computer, so I was sitting right here. Uh, my wife was kind of behind me by the arm of the chair, and Eric was to my left and just a little behind me. Behind you? Yes. And Craig Signorelli was in the room as well? Um, yes, he was. I'd When there was a discussion about something in the wheel or something in, in a computer being deleted, and he asked the question of whether it could be retrieved, mm -hmm. did you have your back to him at that point? Um, occasionally, I may have glanced at him, but for the most part, I was talking more towards the computer. But your wife was with you at that time? But my wife was with me at that time, yes. I have nothing further to sign now. And when you spoke with the police on May 7th, 1990, uh, you, at that time, didn't remember the friend's name? That's correct. Probably four or five months had passed. All right. And you were not uh, able to tell them uh, anything about the person other than to describe him as a friend, correct? That is correct. Right. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else this time? Okay. Mrs. Heyman, directing your attention to uh, September 1st of 1989, uh, do you recall accompanying your, your husband to Beverly Hills from San Diego? Yes, I do. Okay. So this is... The person who we just heard from, this is his wife, who was pregnant at the time and was there, obviously. And you recall going to 722 North Elm in Beverly Hills? Yes. Was there, um, did you go to the, the house several times before you actually were able to locate the person you were to meet? Um, a couple times. We went there and then we had to go to a phone booth to call so that we could get in. Okay, can we uh, adjust this microphone a little bit? Mrs. Heyman, after making the phone calls, or your husband making the phone calls, did you return to the Menendez house? Yes, we did. And uh, did you see somebody waiting for you and your husband? Yes. Who was that? It was Eric and his friend. And when you say Eric, just, just for the record, would you identify who you're talking about? Right here. What, what color is the person wearing today? Um, blue tie. Referring to the defendant. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, you indicated that the defendant, Eric Menendez, was with a friend at that point? Correct. Uh, what, did, what did you and your husband do upon arriving at uh, that house? He, he, Eric let us in, and my husband basically went to work on the computer, and I went upstairs with him, and I sat there with him most of the time. Do you recall a discussion about uh, deleting a will and retrieving a will? Yes. You do? Okay, do you recall approximately when that was, and the time that you were there, that that occurred? On my recollection, it, it's vague because it was, you know, four years ago. Um, my husband was going in through the com computer, and um, he wasn't able to find anything. And Eric had just asked, "Can you retrieve a file after it's been deleted?" And Ed had said something like, "If it wasn't um, deleted by tools or something like that." And I mean, that was weird. Eric just seemed kind of, I don't know, uptight or worried. When the information uh, that was given by your husband regarding um, the retrieval of deleted information on a computer, did Eric Menendez's uh, demeanor change at all that you, you saw yourself? I thought so. What did you see? Well, I would... I thought he looked sort of worried. Now, I had no idea why. Okay. And Mrs. Heyman, you spoke to the police in, uh, on June 5th, 1990. Do you recall that? I'm not for certain on exact days, but I do recall. Was it t sometime after your husband had spoke to them on uh, May 7th, 1990? Yes, yes. 
Do you recall what uh, Eric Menendez's demeanor was like prior to getting the information that you've just uh, related to the jurors? That is, prior to the information about the retrieval, um, or possible retrieval of deleted information, what was his demeanor like? I would say he was, he was casual. He was, I mean, he was very nice. He seemed very easygoing. And his demeanor changed upon hearing this information from your husband? Objection. Overall. Oh, yes. And what did you indicate with respect to his demeanor? Objection has to All right, we have a amplification of what it is that uh, her husband said and then uh, what, if anything, she saw in the defendant's reaction. Ms. Heyman, do you understand what the question is? Yes. What is it that your husband, uh, what, what discussion does your husband have with uh, the defendant, Eric Hernandez? regarding the deletion of information and the possible retrieval of information? Well, I remember basically my husband going through saying everything's been deleted and Eric asking, is it possible to be retrieved once it's been deleted? And my husband said something of the sort, yes, it can be, but if it's used with utilities to wipe it clean or whatever, it, it can't be retrieved. I. What, and what did you notice about Eric Menendez's reaction to that? I thought he looked a little bit worried okay. at that point. Is your, um, your memory is a, a little bit uh, less than what you had back in June of 1990? Would that be fair to say? Yes. Would it refresh your present recollection and take a look at the report that you gave uh, June 5th, 1990? Yes. May I question? Yes. Mr. Seaman, does that refresh your present recollection? Yes. What is it? Would you describe uh, Eric Menendez's demeanor after getting this information Judge as you testified to? The information about the retrieval, possible retrieval of information that had been deleted. I guess I thought he looked scared or worried. And that's what you reported to the police? Yes. Now, with respect to the friend of Eric Menendez that was there that day, uh, September 1st, 1989, did you have a conversation with your husband? a couple of months after you both had been to Beverly Hills to the Menendez house uh, regarding seeing somebody on television? Yes. I don't recall when it was on television. I mean, I don't recall if it was two weeks, three weeks, a month afterward. But we saw, you know, it went on one of the media, hard copy or something like that, and we had seen Eric and um, the friend that we had seen. And his name was Craig. That's what they said. And that was, that was the gentleman that we, I saw Eric with. On, the, on September 1st, 1989. Right. I've nothing further at this time, Ronald. Cross examination. Thank you, Good morning, Mrs. Heyman. Hi. Uh, Mrs. Heyman, let me just try and clarify. You said that your husband told Eric that something had, that had been deleted uh, could be retrieved uh, unless somebody had used a tool to do the deletion. Right. Correct? And it was after uh, finding out this information, uh, including the possibility that information could not be retrieved if a tool had been, been used, that Eric appeared to be concerned. Is that correct? Yes. It was after my husband basically said it could be retrieved. He looked concerned. Okay. But you said today that your husband also told Eric when he told them that it could be retrieved, he said, but if it right. had been deleted with a tool, it can't be retrieved, right? Correct. And he told him this at the same time, he gave him the information about uh, being able to retrieve the information if it had just been deleted, right? Correct. Correct. <laughs> okay. So it was two parts to the information your husband was giving Eric, right? I guess you can say that. Okay. Well, I want you to say it, if it's correct. Yes. Okay. And it was after this kind of two-part information that your husband gave to Eric, then you noticed some change in his demeanor. Correct. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And this happened when you were in the bedroom. Right. When your husband was working on the computer. Right? Yes. You have to answer out loud. Okay. Okay. Mrs. Heyman, would it be... Well, you were at the house on uh, September 1st, correct? 1989. I'm sure that was a date because it was the only day that I was there. I just never you don't wrote it know down. the date yourself. Right. And by the way, you don't know the address yourself. Mr. Kuriyama asked you if you went to 722 North Elm. Do you remember that address? I remember North Elm because we had stopped. Okay. 
between the time you went to the house in September and the time you were first interviewed by the police, did you find out or did you come to know that uh, Eric and his brother had been arrested for killing their parents? Yes. Okay. And when you found out that information, uh, did that change the way you felt and thought about the visit on September 1st, 1989? Well, naturally, we were scared. However, we were scared after we left anyways because we didn't have any idea what had happened. Okay. Um, this was kind of an adventure that you and your husband right. went on. Right. We didn't right. know how they were killed or anything. Okay. I mean, I don't even know why I went up there. I you shouldn't knew, have. You knew when you went up that somebody had, had died? Right. Okay. Uh, now, let me ask you about the news of the arrest, okay? Did that change or color the way you remember the events in September of 1989? No. Okay, you didn't have any reaction to hearing about it? Yes, I did. Okay. But I felt the same way that I did after that I heard the news. Okay. Now, you said when you first arrived at the house, um, you weren't able to get in, right? Correct. And you returned about an hour later, and that was when you saw Eric for the first time? Yes. Where was Eric when you first saw him? Um, as I recall, he was waiting either at the entrance of the gate or right by the house. He let us in. Okay. And. Uh, was he alone when you first saw him, or was he with somebody else? He was with his friend. Okay, so the friend was there as well. Is that right? Yes. And is right. that where you met the friend? Correct. Okay, and when you met the friend, uh, did somebody tell you the friend's name? I, I, I'm surely they did. I'm bad at names. I'm not. I, I'm very good at faces. I just don't, did not recall the name. Okay. When you were interviewed by the police. Uh, in on June 5th, I believe, 1990, you weren't able to tell them the friend's name. Correct. I'm not sure. Okay. Would it help to look at the report about your interview with the police on June 5th, 1990? Sure. Okay. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Would you just look at this and read it to yourself and see if that helps you remember whether you were able to tell them the friend's name? No. So you had forgotten the friend's name at least on June 5th, 1990? Correct. And the police didn't ask you to describe the friend in any way? No. Did the friend uh, go upstairs with you and your husband to the master bedroom? Yes. Okay. And there your husband began his work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. And did uh, the conversation that you just told us about that your husband giving Eric this two part uh, two parts of information did that happen pretty soon after your husband got up there and began working on the computer I would say probably in the first half an hour okay. and during the first half hour did uh, Eric and his friends stay in the bedroom with you I believe so he had offered me a glass of water or a drink and I remember him showing me around the house okay was this during the first half hour or was it after that time I can't be absolutely certain. Okay. At some time, you left with Eric to look at the house. Correct. And did the friend go with you to look at the house? I can't be absolutely certain if he was right there when he was showing me around the house. Okay. You're not sure that he accompanied you? Right. Uh, was, uh, were Eric and the friend in the bedroom during uh, most of the time that you were there at the house, or did they come and go? They came and went. Okay. So they weren't standing there watching everything, but they kind of went on their own right. business. How long were you at the house that day, Mrs. Hamer? I'd say approximately two hours. Now, during the time you were at the house, were you able to uh, look at the friend and see him stand next to Eric? Yes. And were you able to uh, see how tall the friend is, at least in relation to Eric? I, you know, it's, it seems so long ago. I thought that he was like of medium build, he heavy, a little heavier set. Not heavy set, but medium. Dark sandy hair, maybe 5'8", five, 5'9", five, not real tall. Okay. So this was a person who was about 5'8", or 5'9"? I'm, I'm guessing. Okay. Was, uh, is your recollection that this person was the same size as Eric or a different size? I can't honestly remember. Okay. 
And I believe you tell us that he had his, he had a build that was medium. Is that how you described it? Yeah. Uh, how uh, is that? How did that build compare with Eric's? That is, was this person heavier than Eric? Um, yes, but he wasn't. He wasn't heavy. He was just. He, I don't know. He looked like he worked out. It's, no. This okay. This person looked like he lifted weights and had mu muscles and. Could be okay. And you said that his hair was uh, what color? I recall either dark sandy. Between, between sandy and darker. Okay. When we're talking about sandy and darker, are we talking brown or blonde? I thought it was in between brown and blonde. Okay. Uh, do you remember talking to uh, Ms. Abramson, who you can see there, I think, and a defense investigator uh, on March 31st, 1993? Yes. And did they ask you what this person, this friend, looked like? Yes. Okay. And do you recall uh, telling them uh, in March that the friend was taller than Eric? I don't know how tall he is. Okay. Do you recall telling them that he had a, a heavier, bigger build than Eric? Yeah. Okay. Because that's your memory of what this friend looked like. Right. And do you recall telling them that his hair was uh, dark blonde or light brown? That's it. Yeah. That's in between blonde and brown. Okay. So we're talking about sandy or dark brown. Uh, another way of describing that would be dark blonde or light brown. Right? Correct. Okay. Uh, do, do you know? Do you? what uh, color the friend's eyes were. I have no idea. Do you remember describing uh, the friend for Ms. Abramson and the investigator and telling them uh, that his eyes were hazel or light colored? I may have. I, I, I can't say for certain that was, was his color. Okay. Now, it would be correct to say that your memories of this friend are somewhat influenced by uh, seeing someone two times on television. Is that correct? I remember the gentleman that I did see on TV. It, it was, I recall it to be him, because my husband and I, before any of this investigation even happened, and I don't remember if it was two weeks, three weeks, one month that we saw it, but we looked at each other and said, that's the friend that Eric was with. Okay, let me back up and ask you about that particular TV show. Okay, it was before you ever talked to the police, right? Correct. Uh, and yet it was after you had heard about the arrests. It was going. It was just going on. All right. And I don't even know if we heard about the arrest yet. There was someone on the TV that was depicted or described as a friend of Eric. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Was this person being interviewed, or did you just see a picture of him? Um, I think there were a couple. I, th I think he was speaking in one, and then I just saw a glimpse of him walking forward towards the camera. Now, just focusing on this, te the first television show that you saw. Uh, how many friends of Eric? Uh, did you see on the show? I only recalled one because it was the one that I saw. Okay, so there was just one person on that show that was described to be a friend, right? Right. And you don't remember whether that's a prime time or, or you don't remember the title. No, of the it was show. one of those like hard copy or something like that. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Now, after the interview uh, with the defense investigator and Ms. Abramson in March of 1993, you saw another TV show. Is that right? Could you repeat the question? Did you see an, a TV show uh, with this friend uh, pictured after the interview with Ms. Abramson? Yes, I have seen something since. Okay. And uh, on that TV show, uh, you saw the same friend that you had seen on the prior TV show? Yes. Uh, did seeing that TV show uh, help you in your own mind describe the friend that you saw or that you thought you saw previously? I mean, it was the same guy that okay. I remember seeing. Okay. It was the same guy you remember seeing on the first TV show? At, at his house. Okay. Do you remember the person that you saw on the second TV show same. as being the one on the first TV yes. show? And uh, on the second TV show, was this friend talking to the, uh, or was he just, it was a still photograph, if you remember? It wasn't a still photograph. It, I, I don't recall if he was talking or if he was walking. One, I thought, was pictured with Eric and him walking. Okay. Do you remember? I don't know whether or not on the second TV show there was uh, more than one person described as a friend of Eric who was pictured and who was shown? No, you know, I don't. I, I mean, all I focused on the person that I thought I saw at the house. I didn't pay attention to anything else. Right. So you don't know or you don't believe there were any other friends that you saw pictured on the second television show? 
I'm sure if there were, I'm sure he has other friends. I just focused on the one friend that I saw, and I mean. Okay, but did you still, did you see any other friends? I mean, aside from what no, you assumed. No, I didn't. I didn't notice any other friends. Okay, so there was just that one friend. That's on TV. That's the only person I noticed. All right. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Any redirect? Thank you, Hunter. So it's by remembering the face of Eric Menendez's friend that was there on September 1st, 1989, that you recall being uh, shown on television, Craig Signorelli, is that right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> now, how, were you pregnant on this day, September 1st, 1989? Yes. How, were you obviously pregnant? Eight and a half months. Eight and a half months. Thank you. I have nothing for you. Anything else? No, you're on. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You may step down, Rich. My name is Amanda Ann Adams Geyer. Can you spell your address? G E I E R. All right, Mr. Kuriyama. Yeah, the people in the microphone are going Yeah. Ms. Adams Geyer, directing your attention to August 18th, 1989, were you employed? Yes. Where were you employed? Big Five Sporting Goods in San Diego on Convoy Street. Is that at 4838 Convoy Street? Yes, it is. Were you working on August 18th, 1989? Yes, I was. Do you recall when it is you came onto your shift? 1230. In the afternoon? Yes. Now, what was your uh, position there? I was the second assistant manager. Do you recall on that day making a sale of two Mossberg 12-gauge shotguns model 50406. Uh, vaguely, yes. Okay. May I approach, Ron? Yes. You may. Yeah. Ms. Adams, Guy, I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 52, several documents. First of all, I'm going to ask you to take a look at what is a yellow sheet of paper that's entitled Firearms Transaction Record Part 1, Interest State Over the Counter. Do you recognize that form? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize it? These are the forms we use when we sell guns in our store. Do you recognize the writing on that form? Yes, it's mine. Is uh, a copy of that form a duplicate? Is, it a, is this a duplicate? Of that yes, form? it is. All right, we have two of those. If you intend to use those during the trial or during this witness's testimony, we can get the other one for the other jury. Thank you, Your Honor. Give your uh, co-counsel a chance to do that. The record, Your Honor, counsel pointed to Exhibit 53. Yes, the blow-up of Exhibit 52. Thank you. Shall I stand here and watch my meeting? Yes, I'll be fine. Thank you. All right. Now, what does this form tell you? This tells you who purchased the gun, um, the type of gun that's purchased, how many, the price they paid, phone number, address, um, who signed, purchased, who was the employee who took care of the sale of the gun. Okay, taking a look at this form, the face of this form, who filled out uh, this form? I filled, up, filled out the top portion above where the questions are answered. And those are numbers one through seven? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. I also filled out the date next to the signature, and I filled out the bottom portion from the driver's license down to my signature at the bottom. Thank you. Would you take this uh, yellow highlighting pen, the court's permission, and highlight the areas of this particular form that were filled out by the purchaser? Yes. Would you also do that on Exhibit 52? Ma'am, you've indicated that you filled out the portions of 1 through 7, correct? Yes. Would you describe to the jurors how it is that you fill these forms out, what information you need to take down, what information you require to be shown by the customer? Okay, the customer must produce a California State driver's license. Um, when we do the sale of the gun in this particular case, at the time we were taking the person's driver's license, writing it down ourselves in the top portion, we asked the person if the addresses on the driver's license were current at that time. If they say no, then we proceed to have them give us a verbal correction on the address and write that down. Um, we write down the driver's license number. Do you recall at this time whether or not the person who presented uh, this particular driver's license, that of Donovan Gaudreau, uh, had indicated to you that there was a change of address? Yes. Uh, the person making the purchase said that the address is not current on the driver's license and gave me the address that you see now on the form. That being in Section 563 August Street, San Diego, California, 92117? Correct. 
And when the person comes in with a, a driver's license, do you uh, check the person to see whether he, he is similar to the person described in the, uh, on the driver's license? Yes, we do. Now, it indicates that the height of the Donovan you drew is 6'1", and the weight is 165, correct? Mm. Yes. Did you uh, look at the person that was presenting this driver's license to see if he generally matched uh, that in, st in stature, physical stature? Yes. In line 9, you place down a CDL. What does that mean? California driver's license. And in line 10, uh, what does that uh, number, that letter and the following numbers designate? That's the number on the driver's license. And you, you wrote that yourself? Yes, I did. You verified that yourself? Yes. With respect to the other portions of the uh, form, could you describe for the jurors what that information indicates? The bottom half? Yes. Um, that indicates the type of shotgun, or the type of gun that was purchased, whether it be a rifle or a shotgun, the model number of the gun, which is the 50406, the caliber of the gun, which is the 12 gauge, the serial number on that particular gun, which is the, the 2K452565, and the uh, manufacturer, which is Mossberg. And then finally, there's a, a line 18. Is that your signature? Yes, it is. And at that time, you were the second assistant manager? Yes. And then did you place the date? Yes, I did. Going to the reverse side of uh, Exhibit 52, the first sheet, which is a yellow sheet, there appears to be two receipts, correct? Yes. And what is that? Those are the receipts for the purchase of the two guns. If you're purchasing more than one gun, each gun is rung up separately into the register to show that there were two guns purchased. I'm, I'm putting the receipts uh, face up rather than the reverse side of the sheet. What information is reflected on the receipts themselves? The date that it was purchased, the store number it was purchased at, the 4473 number, which is the federal form number assigned to the purchase, the amount of the purchase plus tax, and the amount of cash tendered and the change, as well as the receipt numbers at the bottom. How much is a, or at that time, how much was the Mossberg 12-gauge uh, shotgun? It was, it was $199.99. And uh, it indicates that the person gave you $220? Correct. And you gave change back of 601 Yes, the cashier did. Does that indicate uh, whether this was a cash transaction? Or yes. Was mm -hmm. it in fact a cash transaction? Yes, it was. Now there, there are two uh, receipts, correct? Yes. Now, why is it why is it that you have to have two receipts? It's just company policy. We have we show that we ring up each gun separately as a separate transaction to show that they're both paid for. That's a rule of uh, Big Five. Yes. There are two other documents among Exhibit Fifty Two. Do you have the original to this before you? Yes, I do. What form is this? This is the log books that are kept in our store by our store, uh, indicating when and where guns were signed out to or sold. It's a record kept strictly for our company to keep track and inventory our guns. Which exhibits are you referring to? This is uh, in 52, Your Honor. Exhibit 52. And the corresponding exhibit, uh, the blow up, is what? Is 53. Well, is it A, B, C? Or? This one happens to be unmarked at this time. There's a 52 A and B, which is the yellow sheet, front and back. There is page 36, which is C. So this would appear to be D. Or it has not been marked. It has not been marked. That's the green chart. Yeah. It does not have a green superior court. All right, go ahead. Thank you. So we're designated by page number, page 29. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. What is that? That's the logs that we keep in the store to keep track of when guns came into our store from the warehouse and when they were signed out and sold, either transferred or sold to a customer. This is a corresponding half of another sheet that has the guns and the actual serial numbers listed. With respect to, uh, let's remark this, uh, 52D, this is a, a big five document? Yes. And there's a corresponding sheet you indicated? Yes. Now, how is that set? Do you have a log book? Yes, we have a logbook. Uh huh. Now, where it says federal firearms record, uh, you indicated there was, there was a corresponding sheet. Yes, there's a sheet that would match the other half of that sheet with the same page number. And for every line that you see there, there's a correspo corresponding line with the gun the serial number, the date <coughs> it came into the store, the type of gun it is. And then the lines here where there are customer signatures means that those persons bought the gun that it matches on the other line. So the, the log on the reverse or the matching side would list guns as they came into your, your store? Right, correct. And would that account for the differing uh, dates? Those dates yeah. there are when the guns were purchased and signed out by the customer. So the variance in dates is just when that particular gun was purchased. They're not purchased in any particular order. It's just when that customer purchased the gun. 
With respect to the purchase uh, or the sale of a Mossberg shotgun that was made on August 18th, is there it's the sale reflected on this document, 52D? Yes, it is. 53D. Yes, it is. Would you mark in yellow on 52D uh, that entry and then also on the enlargement 53D? Do you want me to take it out here? Yes. Yes. What is the 415 designation? That is the 4473 number, which corresponds to the yellow sheet up in the corner. That's the firearms transaction number. And the customer, do you watch the customer sign uh, that document? Yeah, we'd watch them sign it, but it's not crucial that we have an exact signature. This is strictly for our records to show when and where the gun purchased. Sometimes the salesperson will fill it out, but the customer signed in that instance himself. And with respect to the date and the city, who uh, really fills that out? It could have been done by the customer or it could have been done by the salesperson, whoever's at the counter waiting to sign out the gun after it's paid for. Sometimes they'll fill that information in so when the customer gets back to the counter, they just have to sign. Or sometimes the customer fills out the whole thing as far as the signature and the address. Okay, and you made this sale? I made the sale. You've indicated that two Mossberg shotguns were sold to the same customer, correct? Yes. Do you see an entry? Uh, that was made regarding the purchase of a, a second Mossberg shotgun by the same customer? Yes, line 13 on the right side. Mm -hmm. okay, would you take that yellow pen and do the same thing that you've done? Thank you. Do you remember about what time the sale took place? To the best of my knowledge, and I'm not positively clear on this, but I do recall the sale being in the evening, sometime around 8 o'clock or after. Do you recall any of the particulars about the sale itself? The only particulars that come to my mind are when the customer came into the store, I believe I stepped out of the office, the customer standing right there where the gun counter is, which is located right next to our office, and indicated that he wanted to by two of the shotguns and pointed at him, and I recall vaguely asking if he wanted to see the guns. Most customers like to look at them and play at them first before they purchase them. No, I'm going to move to strike that. It's not responsive. Objection over the rule. The answer will stand. Please ask the next question. Thank you. What happened next? And the person said, no, that's what I want. And I, from there, I just went in the back, brought the two guns out. We did the paperwork. Um, the person went to the front to pay the cashier. And at that point, I don't really remember whether or not I signed out the gun or if one of my part-time employees signed out the gun. On the second uh, transaction, the purchase of the, the second gun, uh, did the customer give you, again, $220 cash? He would have given it to the cashier. I was not at the register. But does the uh, receipt indicate that? Yes. And that change of $6.01 six was returned to the customer? Yes. Just as, the same as the first transaction? Right. Was any ammunition purchased on that day? Are you referring to something that happened Store yes, college. with those documents in front of According to these receipts, according to these receipts, they do not indicate the ammunition was sold, but we do not ring up the ammunition on the same receipt. So I have no knowledge of any ammunition being sold, but it could have been sold. Do you recall in this transaction that ammunition was sold? I do not recall. Are you familiar with that particular model of Mossberg shotgun? Yes, I am. How many shots does that shotgun have? It'll hold five in the receiver and one in the chamber if you take the plug out. If you don't take the plug out, it'll hold two in the rec uh, receiver, two in the chamber, one in the receiver. Two in the receiver, one in the chamber. Meaning it could be as little as three, but as much as six? Exactly. Um, what is it that you have to do to the shotgun to make it uh, capable of being a six shot? There shotgun? is a six to seven inch dowel that is in the receiver that you must unscrew the barrel and remove. Um, Geyer, how long do you think that this transaction took? Um, just guesstimating, probably 15, 20 minutes. Could you identify the person that made the purchase? No, I can't.
Are there any other forms of uh, identification? I know in this case, uh, the person presented a California driver's license. Are there other forms of identification that are acceptable? Um, military identification is acceptable only if they have proof of residency in the state of California. Any identification used has to prove residency in the state of California. For example, what other And forms? it has to be a picture ID um, for re proof of residency along with military ID, um, probably their orders. Uh, stating how long or when they were assigned into the state. Um, something like a phone bill with an address on it dated six months prior, or a car insurance, something that's dated six months prior showing a California state and their name, address. How old do you have to be to purchase uh, a gun? At, at that time, anyway, 1989, how old did you have to be? For shotguns and rifles, 18. Yes. You had to be an adult? Yes. Were there more than uh, one person there when, the, when you made this transaction? Are you, are you actually making the purchase? I don't recall there being more than one person up at the counter. Thank you. I have nothing further this time. Around. Are you using a double last name? Man, uh, Adam's I just Geyer? got married in May, so, so I'm, I'm actually using Geyer, but okay. all the other stuff had Adams on it. So. All right. But it's okay if I call you Mrs. Geyer. Sure. All right, whatever you, you like. March of 1990, <clears throat> who was it that first brought this transaction to your attention? It was uh, Les and uh, his partner. Detective Zola? Yes, Detective Zola. And uh, his partner, Tom Linehan? I don't recall his name, but... Where was it that you first come in, came in contact with Detective Zola? At Big Five Sporting Goods. The store that you work in? Yes. And do you recall what date in March of 1990 that was? March 14th. And do you know that, have you been provided with copies of uh, your previous statements? Yes. That's how come you remember that yes. date? Okay. Have you also uh, been provided with a copy of your testimony from last year before the uh, Los Angeles County Grand Jury? Yes, I have. Now, do you recall that when Detective Zoller showed you uh, the ATF form, that's how I'm going to refer to that top document, the mm -hmm. firearm transaction record. It's commonly known as the ATF form, right. isn't it? For alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Correct. When he showed you that form in March, uh, March 14th of 1990, you told him that you did not remember the sale at all. Right. You had no recollection of who bought the guns, male, female, one, two, what time of day it was, nothing. Not at the top of my mind, no. Okay. And you said you didn't remember the driver's license specifically that was used for the sale. Meaning? He asked, you, he asked you if you remembered the license that you were shown. Do you remember telling him you didn't? I don't remember. Yeah, I remember telling him I didn't recall it. Okay. And do you recall Detective Zoller asking you if the person, the purchaser, who filled out the form resembled the picture on the driver's license? Yes, I do remember him asking. And do you remember telling him that you don't remember if he did or not, but you assumed that he did? Right, correct. And do you recall that Detective Zoller showed you what are called photo lineup cards? Correct. And that's a card that has the pictures of six people on each card? Correct. And he showed you two different cards? Yes. And you selected a number of a person who you said looked familiar to you but not in reference to the sale because you didn't remember the sale. Is that correct? Correct. Last August, 1992, you testified before the grand jury, correct? Correct. And uh, isn't it true that you testified under oath before the grand jury that you didn't recall whether the individual to whom you sold the guns was alone or with somebody? Correct. And you did not, uh, when you testified before the grand jury, uh, give any specifics of this transaction at all. Nothing about the time of day, nothing about the person being alone at the counter, nothing. Correct. You never said anything about asking the person if the address on the license was their most recent address and receiving some new information, have you? I remember stating that before, but I don't know if it's been on any of the, um, the forms for those testimonies, but I have, I have been asked that before and I have stated it. So you think you told someone that before, but you, you've read your reports and you read the testimony and it doesn't appear. And it's I, not on the grand jury testimony, no, it's not. And it's not in the report of March 14th, is it? No, it's not. And it's not on the report of uh, June 21st, 1993 that you gave to Detective Zoller the last time you spoke to him? I don't didn't. recall that. Okay. Now, did something happen between last August and now that makes you think you remember this transaction? After looking at, at paperwork and reviewing schedules and stuff, certain things come back to you. I mean, I can't point out a picture of who was there to make the purchase, but 
you know, looking at the situation and the circumstances and going back in time as to what was going on at that time in the store, some things do come back. So but at, at the time that Detective Zoller talked to me, no, I did not remember anything off the top of my head. You know, looking at the transaction, the receipts, who was there, I do vaguely remember parts of the sale, but I can't point out a person, per se, and I do know the procedures and what would have went on, so I can say that, you know, yes, I did look at a driver's license, yes, I did write this down, yes, I did ask if this address was correct. So because you always do sale, that. I always do that. All right, so some of it is deduction and some of it is your usual custom and practice. Is correct. that right? Mm -hmm. But none of it, I think you said before, is actually the picture in your mind of this event. Is that correct? Uh, as far as a person, I didn't spend a lot of time with the person. The people I remember the most are people who want to sit there and discuss guns, and those are the people who repeatedly come in our store, ask questions, play with the guns. This was a you know quick in and out, I want two of those, and leave it at that sale. Well, when did you remember that part, the I want two of those part? What in the paperwork, for example, that you reviewed told you that? Nothing in the, just looking at the circumstances, looking at our schedules of who is working, looking at my schedule, just, if you want to say it's deduction, you can say it's deduction. Okay. Deduction as contrasted with memory. Right. Huh. I did tell this to Cindy Erdelay, your investigator, when she spoke to me a while back also. You spoke to Cindy, my investigator, May 27, 1993, right? Correct. And to the best of your recollection, is that the very first time you told anybody the result of your deductions? Anybody who's uh, in contact with this case, I might have discussed it with my other manager who's, who was there when we've had other discussions about the and case. Did, all right, so to, to, are you relying to some extent then on what yet other people have been deducing, like your managers? No, no. Okay. So Cindy is the first person connected with the case that you gave these yes. deductions to. Okay. Now, <clears throat> was this time, this time in August, 89, close to the beginning of the hunting season? It's close to right before death season is September 1st. Okay. And uh, at that time of year, just before the start of the dove hunting season, does that Big Five store uh, usually have a lot of shotgun ammunition, hunting type ammunition, stacked on the floor in front of the gun counter? Yes. And is it your belief that on August 18th, 1989, there were such stacks of shotgun uh, game ammunition on the floor in front of the counter? Yes. Now, if I understand your testimony, uh, the procedure would be that I came to you and I said, I want to buy that gun. You would then make out the ATF form. That would right. be the first thing. Correct. Okay. And I'd give you identification and you'd make out your part and I'd sign my part. Correct. Now, at that point, you don't hand the gun over to me, though. No. I have to go pay for it. Correct. So I take that ATF form, that yellow form, and I go to a cashier and I tender to the cashier the money necessary to purchase the gun. Correct. And if there are two guns there, that cashier is going to ring it up as two different transactions. Correct. And if there are 10 guns, she's going to ring it up as 10 different transactions. Correct. And every register receipt for each individual gun will then be stapled to the back of that form for your inventory control for the federal government. Correct. Now, if I then, I pay at the cashier, I come back to you now with the receipts attached to the form. Correct? Mm -hmm. And at that point, you're ready to give me the guns, but we have to log it out. Correct. And so that's when the entries are made in the logbook. Correct. And then you hand me my purchase. Correct. Now, there's nothing stopping me after you've handed me those guns. And as I'm walking back towards the cashier from picking up boxes of the shotgun ammunition that's stacked in front of your counter and paying for it on the way out. Correct. It could also have been paid for at the time when they went up to pay for the guns. Sure, and that wouldn't show up on the receipts that are attached to that form. Correct. Because ammunition sales do not have to be attached to any kind of federal form. Correct. And uh, did I understand you correctly? It's the store policy, in fact, to ring up the gun sale just as the gun sale. Correct. It was at that time. Now the computers are different, so it's done a little differently. Okay, but we're interested in, right. in 1989. Now, just to a complete blank. It's interesting. Um, does, did the store in 1989 carry more than one brand of shotgun shell? Of shotgun shell, yes. And can you tell us for dove hunting season, what are the size shotgun shell, I mean the size of the pellets that are most suitable for that sort of hunting? For dove hunting? Mm -hmm. uh, generally seven and a half or eight. And do some of the shot shells, in fact, for dove hunting say dove load right on them? Yes. Now, is it your recollection, uh, first of all, do you still carry this model number, this Mossberg 50406? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Uh, when Detective Zoller came down there in March of 1990, did you show him one? I don't recall whether or not I showed him one. Has anybody connected with the prosecution in this case contacted you 
and asked whether or not you've got a 50406 around. Maybe not me particularly. There's three other managers in the store. so. They but I don't have them here. So did they contact you? Not to say whether or not I had one in the store at that time. I don't recall anybody asking me. I mean, what I'm asking, in case I'm confusing you, is has anybody from the prosecution asked if they could either get or examine or buy a 50406 Mossberg from you now? I don't recall. And is it your um, testimony that this particular model shot, uh, uh, shotgun from Mossberg uh, always has that wooden dowel in it? Yes, it does. Now, is it your testimony that the dowel slides into the barrel, or does it slide into the, the receiver? The receiver. That's where you would load the shot shells. Correct. OK, so it's just a piece of wood, isn't it? Yes. That, keeps, that fills up part of the receiver. Right. So you can't put more than two shells in there. Correct. And all you have to do is unscrew the cap at the end of the receiver, and out spills the dowel. Correct. Well, you have to pull it a little bit, because it's got a rubber gasket on it, but it's fairly simple to get out. Okay, you said sometimes it does, and sometimes do they come without it? Without the gasket. Right gasket, yeah. Different models have different. But it's not hard to remove, and as far as you know, most people who buy shotguns remove them. They can't remove them if they're going to use them out in the hunting field. It's, it's required to have them in there for fish and game. You can't have more than two shells in the receiver. But for any other use, home protection, I don't believe it's against the law to take it out. OK, and, and whether you, it's against the law or not, you don't know if people who even use it for hunting or taking it out, nothing happens unless there's a game warden around. Right, exactly. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further. Uh, Lyle Menendez? There you go. All right, any redirect? Yes, thank you, Your You indicated that it wasn't until March 14, 1990, almost seven months after you had made the sale, that the police uh, were able to locate those documents that you've uh, testified to today, correct? Yes. The answer is stricken. As far as you know, the day that you saw Detective Zoller on March 14, 1990, was that the first time that those documents had been shown to the police? Sustained. Did you give those documents to the Beverly Hills detectives on March 14, 1990? I did not personally. I believe my head manager, Reggie Clevett, dealt with them as far as giving them the paperwork. Your Honor, I'm going but to get to that and just try to make a personal observation. All right, the objection sustained, the answer is stricken. You can okay, pursue you, it further. This Reggie Clevett, he's the manager of uh, Big Clevett? He, yes, he's at the that manager time? at that time and now. On March 14, 1990, did you see those documents in your school? Yes. Now, you said in cross-examination that on May 27, 1993, a defense investigator by the name of Cindy Utterly to see you? Yes. And you gave her certain information? Yes. Certain things you remember? Yes. Well, Did you? I'm going to object to you know, describe this information. Objection overruled. Thank you, Your Honor. I Thank told Cindy Utterly that I did not see the customer at point of entry into the store. I did not know whether there was another person with them who might have been shopping around. I only recall, and this is vaguely, that there was only one person at the counter. That's what I told Cindy Utterly. Did you tell Cindy also that the person appeared to know what he wanted? Yes. And said he wanted the two Mossberg shotguns? Yes. And then that, thereafter, then, did you then call uh, Detective Zoller at the Beverly Hills uh, Police Department? I had talked to him some point after, but I don't believe I directly called him for that purpose. However, did you give him that same information that you had given to the defense investigator? I mentioned it to him, and he told me that I hadn't told him that before. Now, do you recall testifying before the grand jury in August of uh, 19... 92? Yes. You recall making a statement? I had the driver's license in my possession when I filled out the form. Question. Now, if someone were to present you with a driver's license and had had a change of address, would you then, would they advise you of that orally? And your answer, I ask every time if the information on the driver's license is correct. Question. If the person says no, then you would fill out the new address and you answered correct. Yes. You remember testifying to that? Yes, I do. Finally, that there, there has been some cross-examination about dove loads, the ammunition. Yes. Did the person buying these two Mossberg shotguns tell you that he was going to go dove hunting? Not that I recall, but I don't remember much of a conversation at all with the person, or even having one other than filling out the paperwork. Thank you. I have nothing further this time. Any further cross? No, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. You may step down. You're excused. Thank you. All right. That brings us to the end of part five. That was interesting. <laughs> the defendants are oh. in court. Stop. All right. Sorry. <laughs> um, so that was interesting testimony today. I don't even know what to say because <laughs> the
these states witnesses um they just don't seem very reliable to me even you know the the last one who sold the shotguns it's like okay you don't remember but now you remember so it's just it almost seems like a lot of people are like hopping on the case because of, of its notoriety because it you know it's like their 15 minutes of fame or something i don't know that's kind of my impression by like the both of the computer consultants and the friends craig some friend and uh who else were what uh what other friend was it uh glenn stevens him i didn't like him either so <laughs> um yeah so interesting a lot of interesting things coming out in this trial and um as your everyday sheep mentioned a lot of the testimony today is going to make more sense when we get to Casey Whalen's testimony, who is, uh, we're not going to get to him or her, I'm assuming him, um, until part six of the defense's case. So that's going to be a little while, but um, hopefully that'll all make it come together today. Um, so what else? Next, the next episode is going to be, um, what is it? Sorry, I'm losing my spot. All right, so uh, part six, it's going to, oh, going to be the testimony of the medical examiner, and that's going to be the whole part. So, um, yeah. So, but I do want to mention that I have a doctor's appointment. Um, I, I've got autoimmune stuff when I get infusion, so I'm pretty much gone for the day. So I'm not going to be able to stream, um, unfortunately, this Friday. Uh, but I do want to get into like a regular schedule where we're doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So basically this time every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I want to keep this schedule. Just unfortunately this Friday I can't. But we'll be back on track on Monday. And then maybe I might throw in like a weekend stream every now and then. Um, but for the most part, I want to keep like Monday, Wednesday, Friday because that seemed to be what everybody was good with. And I'm good with that too. So that works out. So if there's any other questions or anything else, did I miss any comments? Um, I don't think so. All right. So thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I, you know, you guys are, you know, I have, was having a crappy day, so it just, I didn't feel really well. So just being here and having you guys around, it, it really helped lift me up. So thank you guys for being here. I appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one. Take care guys. If you've been impacted by a true crime and would like your story told in your own words, or if you or someone you know has been wrongfully convicted or accused of a crime, please write to crimeincourtchannel at gmail.com and tell us your real true crime encounters. Thanks for watching.